Uh, baik kita mulai Bapak dan Ibu sekalian Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, Very good morning everyone uh, Thank you very much for joining this guest lecture on coastal engineering and tsunami mitigation So we will have two speakers in, in this forum So my name is Shamsidi I will moderate the whole session of this uh, guest lecturer. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a Victor background on my side since I'm uh, online from the hospital. Um, we uh, device that not uh, make me able to uh, switch on my virtual background. Uh, the guest lecturer will be uh, delivered into uh, two languages. First will be in English by Professor Hanman Fries from Georgia Tech. And the second one will be in Bahasa Indonesia mostly from uh, uh, Dr. Benazi from Unitas Kajamada. Uh, I don't know if uh, my colleagues will show a CV of mine. Uh, is there any? Okay, uh, right. Uh, right, so Today, we will have two uh, speakers, important speakers. Uh, this program is part of the World Class Professor Program. Uh, we are honored to host uh, Professor Hermann Fritz. Uh, he is a professor from uh, Georgia Institute of Technology or Georgia Tech uh, from the Department of School of Civil Engineering and Environment. Uh, he's an expert on tsunamis and coastal hazard. Uh, we yeah, have been publishing a number of extensive publications on those uh, topics. Uh, and he also uh, conduct a number of research on storm surge, uh, landslide, submarine volcanic eruption. And he has a number of uh, experiences in conducting field surveys uh, in some of them uh, in Indonesia and some other parts uh, of the world like in Samoa and also some um, part in, um, in Japan and also in, in Africa. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Herman Fitz uh, also uh, got his doctorate degree from uh, ETH Zurich in 2002 from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, and then moved uh, to United States as a professor at uh, Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian, kuliah tamu hari ini akan disampaikan dalam dua bahasa. Kita akan punya dua uh, pembicara. Pertama adalah Profesor Herman Fritz dari uh, Georgia Institute of Technology di Amerika Serikat, dan kemudian akan ada uh, Bapak Dr. Benazir dari Universitas Gajah Mada. Dan kuliah tamu ini akan diselenggarakan dalam dua bahasa. Presentasi dari uh, Prof. Herman Fritz akan dalam bahasa Inggris, dan kemudian uh, dari Dr. Benazir akan dalam, uh, sebagian besar mungkin akan dalam bahasa Indonesia. Bapak-Ibu yang akan bertanya, uh, dipersilakan nanti untuk raise hand, uh, dan kemudian kita akan persilakan untuk bertanya, dan kita akan unmute uh, mikrofonnya. Uh, tapi uh, sebelum itu, kita akan, uh, saya sudah sampaikan tadi beberapa CV dari Prof. Herman Fritz, bahwa beliau adalah profesor dari Georgia Institute of Technology, dan program ini terselenggara uh, berkat uh, program yang disponsor oleh Kementerian Ristek, uh, Kementerian uh, Pendidikan Kebudayaan dan Riset Teknologi Indonesia, uh, di bawah program World Class Professor Program tahun 2022. Profesor Herman Fries adalah profesor tamu di uh, dalam program ini di Universitas Syakola, khususnya di Tsunami and Disaster Mitigation Research Center. So, nama saya Sam Sidik, saya akan memoderatori uh, sesi ini sampai dengan siang nanti. Saya adalah juga uh, ketua uh, TDMRC Universitas Syakola. Uh, so, without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Herman Fries uh, to start uh, 
this lecture. Uh, so we have uh, a number of undergraduate students, if I may introduce to Professor Herman Fitz here. Um, <clears throat> they also wait in this for participants. I will, we will defer, uh, defer them to the YouTube link of the DMC later on. Uh, and this uh, se whole session will be recorded. Um, so uh, please, uh, Professor Hammond, please, you can start your uh, lecture now. Okay, um, Salma Pagi, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so today, um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, about the U.S. experiences um, with, <clears throat> with hurricanes and coastal protection. So um, I know in Indonesia, you're not necessarily that hurricane prone because uh, you're very close to the equator. So chance, chances are that, you know, you, you get very few. Um, however, you do get big storms, okay? Um, and big storms come with very similar impacts. Um, and another impact that's very important is um, sea level rise in the future due to climate change um, will essentially lead to effects that can be similar to what you have in certain areas if you experience storm surge. So I do think that uh, um, there are some lessons to learn here, um, although you are, in, you are in tsunami land, but um, um, this allows to show some examples of... Okay, let's see. So Hurricane Ian, um, just uh, a month ago, essentially, um, came ashore in South Florida and impacted an area that is primarily very touristy. So it's not a whole lot of industry here, but um, caused a lot of damage. Um, and this is something that happens very often in the United States. So the biggest coastal impacts are actually from hurricanes um, in terms of cost by far in the United States. Um, all the $100 billion disasters have all been hurricanes. So um, we haven't had a major tsunami uh, in a long time um, that would come anywhere near in terms of uh, damage numbers. Um, typically very sandy areas. Um, so then you get a lot of uh, beach erosion. Um, you get a lot of manufactured islands. Um, you get highways that get washed away. So you see this and you see this kind of repeating itself every couple of years in different places and particularly on the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. Um, now this is south of Florida and <clears throat> some very touristy area. You see big uh, sort of uh, pier here in Fort Myers and then you see the pier afterwards. Um, this kind of just shows you uh, the coastal impact. Um, it's also a very touristy area, so there is no interest uh, in terms of having big seawalls, for example, as protective measures, because people want to enjoy the beach, okay? The weather here is very warm, just like in Sumatra. Um, so, um, yeah. In terms of coastal erosion, you get effects that are similar um, to what you can also see um, during tsunamis, okay? I think in particular when there are places where you do have Tsunamis and hurricanes, you actually have to be quite uh, careful interpreting those, uh, interpreting those deposits uh, because they can be due to a number of reasons, okay? It can be a storm, a hurricane, or it can be a, a tsunami, okay? But not every deposit has to be, uh, has to be from a tsunami um, because you can get very similar impacts here um, if you just look at this example here. Um, now, typically, the hurricane impacts are limited to the beach, um, so the most of it is from the water, okay? So, yes, hurricanes do come with, uh, you know, up to 300 kilometer per hour wind speeds, so very fast winds. But if you look very carefully, in terms of wind speed, actually, the protection is quite good. Even this house on the beach here, actually, the roof is still there. Um, also, if you look back here, a lot, a lot of the houses have intact roofs. So it is really the area that gets flooded. Um, and then where the storm waves are still strong, uh, where the bulk of the damage occurs. Um, because in terms of wind engineering, there has been a lot of success uh, in the last 30 years since Hurricane Andrew hit Miami in 1992. There has been a lot of improvement in terms of, in terms of wind engineering. 
So structurally to fasten the, uh, making the structures more resistant against the wind has been very successful. But in terms of the coastal impact, because the water, the storm surge, the flooding, and in particular the storm waves that beat things up, um, things have, have, been, uh, have been slower. Now, this is a challenge uh, for, for the southeast of the United States and for parts of it. Um, the most challenged city is, of course, New Orleans. Uh, the city of New Orleans at the mouth of the Mississippi River uh, has been there for 300 years. Uh, it's a thinking city. Okay, so you can think of the you can think of this uh, a little bit as um, you can think of this a little bit like um, Amsterdam or Jakarta. Okay, very low lying area. Okay, so you were colonialized by the Dutch. Okay, and the Dutch live below sea level, just like in New Orleans. If you remove the dikes in the Netherlands you essentially are completely underwater for large parts of the country, okay? Um, and unfortunately, on the north coast of Java, you have similar situation in Semarang, for example, with sinking land. Uh, you have similar situation also in Jakarta, where parts of the city um, is sinking. Now, in the U.S., the approach has been to build levees, okay, similar to dikes in the Netherlands, and essentially surround the city and protect it. Now, every, every so long comes a new hurricane. So 1965, Hurricane Betsy floods it. Congress implemented, the Congress in Washington, D.C. implemented a very expensive uh, hurricane protection plan for 200-year storms, okay? So this is 1965. So 200-year hurricane protection. Uh, but then comes 1969, Hurricane Camille. And uh, the coastal uh, erosion here is very dramatic. Uh, so you can see here a highway uh, that's along the coast that has been completely um, eroded. You can see large vessels that have been thrown onto the beach. You can get a very similar image from very large tsunamis. Okay, you can go to Japan tsunami 2011 and you get a very similar image. Okay, um, so um, we can get, you know, eight meters um, of uh, sea level rise due to storm surge, and that will essentially bring these large vessels in. Okay, so this is essentially uh, what, what happened here. Okay, now jump 40 years. Okay, so we go from 1965. To, the design was to protect for 200 years. Okay, 200 years kind of hazard, um, but it only took 40 years for the next big storm to come and to essentially completely um, engulf, um, engulf uh, New Orleans. And Hurricane Katrina was very big. Uh, the size of the storm is huge. And the size of the storm is more critical than the sheer wind speed. This is also why what I'm presenting is also relevant to you. You can have very big storms. You don't necessarily need to have a hurricane to cause, uh, to cause very similar damage. Um, the wind part of it, I think, has been solved to a large part. Uh, I think a lot of the wind damage, um, we have good measures uh, to engineer against. So here you can see the storm coming through the Caribbean, South Florida, and then Category 5, very high wind speed. Um, 300 kilometers per hour wind speeds, and then essentially um, making landfall. And the city of New Orleans is actually not in the hardest hit part. That is actually further, uh, further to the east. But most of the people died uh, in New Orleans. Um, so this was actually um, quite a bit after um, uh, the Indian Ocean tsunami. So I was actually coming back from Madagascar when this happened. So I was surveying disasters in the Indian Ocean uh, in 2005, and, and then Hurricane Katrina strikes back home. So hurricanes essentially push the water in front, okay? They push the water in front, and they push it, push it ashore. Uh, and this has been going on for a long time. This is an older event here. This is uh, Hurricane George uh, on a very similar track like uh, Hurricane Katrina. So this was not unexpected. Um, now, tight gauges... Um, they completely failed, okay? So this is the United States, but tide gauges um, is a global problem. They, they have a tendency to fall out and to break, and that not just, uh, um, and that not just, um, uh, and not just overseas, but all during tsunamis, uh, like I've shown for Chile, for example, um, but, also, uh, but also during hurricanes. For example, the state of Mississippi, all the, all the tide gauges broke. Uh, Eastern Louisiana, all the tide gauges, uh, um, all the tide gauges broke as well. And uh, the wetland loss, uh, the wetland loss is huge, um, as you can see, uh, as you can see here. Um, it's also completely artificial because we have channels, so we're trying to keep, we're trying to keep the, uh, the river, uh, but it becomes essentially like a, like, a, like a chicken leg, okay? It becomes like a, fur, like a bird foot uh, delta, 
it's not a natural delta like you have the Irrawaddy delta um, in uh, in Myanmar. Uh, the the river levees uh, themselves, so the the river is forced into a pass. So the river's on the left there with the navigation of the big vessels is forced into a pass, and and the river is actually higher than the land on the right. So basically, what this means is when you are when you are driving, then the ships are higher than the road and then the land next to it. Okay, that's because that's because the levees are higher. So it's a completely engineered uh, engineered infrastructure. Okay, um, which there are serious questions about the sustainability. Fortunately, during Hurricane Katrina, the Mississippi River levees uh, remained intact, uh, but there are other levees surrounding neighboring neighborhoods um, that failed or were very close to failure. So you can see a seawall here on an eye wall on a levee. Um, you see the scouring behind it and part of it collapsing. You can see a grad student there. Um, and it, once, the, once the levee collapses, then the land behind it will completely flood, okay? So you will essentially then end up completely on the wood. This is actually the refrigerator in the tree, okay? So the refrigerator gets into the tree um, because it floats, okay? It's very heavy, okay? Everybody who has moved the refrigerator knows that. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's very heavy. Um, so the, the big challenge here is that um, once you flood, you're underwater, okay? Because you're below sea level. So with students, uh, just like you, um, we went out and because uh, there was really not much data in the impacted area um, at the time, uh, we did tsunami surveying basically for hurricanes. Okay, so we went out collecting high water marks, which is essentially the same thing, uh, which is essentially the same thing um, we, uh, uh, we do after, after, after tsunamis as I've shown. Uh, and we get, uh, you know, high water marks up to 10 meters high. We get very large inundation distances because the storm surge has time to flood. Okay, it can flood over half a day and then half a day back out. So if many hours time to flood, you can get inland flooding up to 50 kilometers along rivers, for example. Okay, so within, in very flat areas. Um, and there's also a series of barrier islands. So the series of barrier islands, they're basically sandy islands in a shallow, in a shallow sound, okay? Um, and they suffer significant erosion. So the land is only about two meters above sea level. Um, so once the, so once the uh, hurricane comes in, the storm surge essentially creates um, sea, new seafloor because it basically engulfs the entire island, okay? So they basically have six, seven meters of water on top of the island. And you don't see the island anymore, okay? So, and there are actually houses on it, and, and some of these houses actually survive. Um, but um, these barrier islands, um, they're essentially like a natural barrier, okay? A sandy natural barrier, um, but they've been degrading, okay? So they've been eroding. Um, East Ship Island <clears throat> is almost completely gone here. And um, it used to be one big island, okay? It used to be one big island. And then Hurricane Camille cut it into two. Hurricane Katrina almost got rid of East Chip. And now the United States is spending a lot of money trying to artificially rebuild the islands, okay? So artificial rebuilding basically means pumping sand from one location offshore to uh, reform the islands uh, with a process called beach nourishment. <clears throat> so after the storm, uh, these are pine trees, um, very similar to what you have in Banda Acha here as well. You have pine trees actually, in particular in the... Uh, in the uh, reforested area somewhere in Lokna, you see very large pine trees now. So that's quite similar to <clears throat> quite similar to what we have. And basically, uh, the waves they will grind the bark off the tree. So then it gives you kind of a mark of how high the water is. Okay. So you can see a student here. <clears throat> you can see a student here, and um, it's about a twenty-five. It's about 25 meters here, okay, just to give you, just to give you some, uh, some idea, um, 25 feet. So it's about eight meters here in terms of, in terms of, the, uh, in terms of the height. Uh, the rod here is not a five meter rod. This is a 7.5 meter uh, uh, rod. So it's about eight meters. So roads are road. <clears throat> Islands get cut in two. And uh, this is an oil rig, for example, okay? So the Gulf of Mexico is also famous for oil. Um, big oil companies in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Louisiana and Texas in particular, being the two biggest states for oil production, uh, offshore oil production in the United States. Um, this oil rig actually was 100 miles away. 
So it drifted more than 150, 160 kilometers uh, from, from the mouth of the Mississippi River to this location. And it's highly damaged. Uh, the oil company is trying to pull it out and then fix it. Coastal erosion here, um, as you can see. And then that position uh, on a private boat dock um, on the other side of the island. So basically, the entire Sandy Island kind of moves uh, by one football field. Okay, so basically moves to the north because one side erodes and the other side has, has that position. Uh, and at the time, we went out with uh, with some of the geologists, uh, um, one of them being Brian McAdoo, who also worked uh, on the Java tsunami here in uh, and also the Sumatra tsunami on on on, on sediments. Um, and um, we also collected sand samples. So you get very similar deposits actually from storms. So one has to be very careful. Not every deposit um is a tsunami it can also be a storm okay now in terms of uh houses along the coast um these are hotels and casinos here and you can see all the wind speed was very big it's actually almost no wind damage okay so there's no not a single window broken here this building is uh, more than 100 meters tall um it's a hotel uh, um, but you can see here the bottom up damage is from the storm waves okay so the storm waves are going to cause the bulk of the damage uh that are riding on top of the storm surge so you need to bring the storm surge up, and then with storm waves, you will get a lot of damage. Uh, reconstruction here. This thing was rebuilt uh, a year later, okay, and was reopened um, one year later. Um, now, another concept was for casinos. Uh, the casinos have to be in the water. This is why you, it was the law at the time. Uh, that's changed since, but the casinos have to be in the water for gambling. So then, basically, they can also be built on a barge, okay, and the hotel kind of like a barge in a port, but this barge then can float over the highway and impact the building and essentially, um, <clears throat> and essentially then, um, you know, um, cause a lot of damage due to the barge impact, okay? So this thing was in the water, goes over a four-lane highway. This is a four-lane highway. There are four lanes there, okay? And <clears throat> then impacts into a building. Now, ports are, of course, very exposed for storms. So you can see here, uh, you can see here, um, Port of Gulfport, uh, Mississippi, okay, which is uh, a large port, uh, and particularly for uh, this one's primarily for import export of agriculture goods. Uh, you can see here the roofs are actually intact, but the water was so high that all the warehouses uh, got completely washed through. Even the even the ship cranes, uh, even the ship cranes, uh, um, um, the gearboxes and so forth at the bottom uh, got damaged. Um, so this just gives an idea how high the water was uh, through this uh, port infrastructure. Um, so if you have big storms and if you have a combination of storm surge, or if in the future you do sea level rise, your infrastructure is lower, you might find yourself uh, in, a, in a very similar situation. Um, then large areas of flat land were inundated. Uh, you get a lot of coastal erosion. You can see here along the road. And um, you can see then, uh, and you can see then at that position, in, uh, in in a private yard, okay. So there there are uh, there's almost one meter of uh, sand in the in the deposit where there used to be grass. This area was also uh, cleaned up and and, and rebuilt. Um, and the bridge in the background um, has been and the bridge in the background has been rebuilt to a much higher standard. Now bridges uh, were the, some of the big victims uh, for this storm. Okay, so. So any bridge engineer, okay, if the bridge is not high enough, okay, um, then essentially your waves are going to start hitting your hitting your brick deck from below, and those brick decks will start to pop like dominoes, okay? And so that causes a lot of problems because when you have nice highways and then these bridges uh, collapse, then essentially the access is no longer there, okay? So afterwards, when you try to go back there and, uh, and bring things in, uh, then this can be uh, this can be quite complicated. Um, so this gives you a, a scale comparison here. Um, so the old bridges were basically too low. Okay, they were built. They were there for decades. Um, but the big storm took care of it, and the new bridges are much higher now. So the same kind of storm would not cause any significant damage anymore. And of course, it's also better for navigation because the big ships. And sailing boats with uh, tall masts uh, can uh, can uh, now go through. Well, let's look at New Orleans. So New Orleans is a little bit like Amsterdam, okay, or a little bit like Jakarta or Semarang. 
It's very low lying. Uh, it has some coast, but uh, it's not directly exposed to the shoreline. Um, but it sits between the river and uh, and the sound uh, that's connected to a brackish lake. And <clears throat> the whole city is essentially surrounded by water and in different directions. Um, it's on a delta. It's sinking naturally, okay? Um, like most deltas do, like the Netherlands are, for example, also sinking naturally. Um, and there would be questions to ask there as well. Uh, likewise, for places like Semarang and Jakarta, where you have land that is sinking, okay? So land here can be sinking a centimeter per year. In some places, it can be as much as three centimeters per year, okay? So that means your land is already going down. And that, that's all. No earthquake, nothing, okay? Just the land is, is, is essentially sinking because it's all alluvial deposition, weak soil from, uh, from the river, historically speaking. Um, and there's no new addition of sediments because once you develop, once you develop, once you build, uh, you essentially, um, like a crown put on a tooth by a dentist, okay? That tooth will no longer grow, right? So basically there's no more new deposition. So levees in every direction. The city is completely encircled by 700 kilometers of levees. Okay, you have to imagine this, 700 kilometers of levees. Okay, so levees in every direction. And this is a, um, a, a lakeside, which is connected to the ocean. So it's brackish seawater, um, but it looks uh, integrated into a park. Um, a lot of these levees survive. They're about five meters tall here. Um, but then when we, um, we go to city. Um, there's some places, unfortunately, some of these levees, when you have 700 kilometers of levees, you can see some watermarks here. They're actually not that high. But when you have a failure of a levee somewhere along those canals, uh, then essentially uh, water will flow in and you will get destruction. Okay. So this is basically uh, what this is basically what you can uh, what you can see here, because these houses are below sea level. Okay. So the houses are below sea level, okay? So you have places in Java, like Semarang, where you have houses that are going in this direction, okay? They're sinking, uh, likewise for, 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 uh, for the north of Jakarta. So once you build levees, the problem is that once the levees fail, then the entire area is on the water. So basically there's one hole, 100 meters long, more or less, and basically that leads to an entire part of the city underwater. Now, when it comes to, comes to victims um, with hurricanes, like with tsunamis, the first rule is to try to evacuate, okay, and to try to get people out. Um, however, you know, there are people who say, oh, well, I'm not going to evacuate and so forth. And there are people who don't have the means to evacuate. Um, it's also expensive. People think, oh, well, we'll be okay. So then they gamble on uh, maybe we should or maybe we shouldn't. So um, I always recommend um, evacuating and getting out of harm's way. But so over here uh, to the right, uh, we have to the east here, uh, we have the Mississippi Sound and water is pushed in here along these canals. And then there's one big breach here, the floods, this area called the Lower Ninth Ward. And that's where there's about 1,000 fatalities, okay? So that neighborhood is, uh, is about six meters below sea level. That's actually one of the lowest neighborhoods. And unfortunately, the poorest people live at the lowest below sea level. Um, so, um, this is where we have about a thousand fatalities. There's a levee here, uh, the part that's not collapsed, <clears throat> the canal on the right, houses on the left, and then uh, you see uh, large breaches here on some of these levees. So you have, so you have eye walls um, with uh, sheet metal piles, uh, sheet piling, and then you have um, earthen uh, embankments. And uh, you can see here the younger version of myself, just for scale here. But once, once um, the levy breaches, you essentially get what's called a dam break wave, okay? Basically, it's similar to when you have a dam failing because on one side, you have a 15 feet levy that is a five meter tall levy, more or less. And you have land that is six meters below sea level. So once the thing collapses, you have 11, 12 meter wall of water that essentially is going to rush in. And that can then cause a lot of, uh, a lot of damage. So when you're trying to protect um, cities with levees um, <clears throat> and storm surge barriers, okay, 
And there are large cities around the world protected by storm surge barriers. It's not just New Orleans, okay, and not just Amsterdam. It's also cities like London, uh, cities like Tokyo, uh, and they're all prone to uh, prone to typhoons, for example, in Tokyo, and they have similar barriers. And a lot of land, um, also when you claim land, um, when you build out into the ocean, okay, you have a lot of claimed land, um, um, also in places like Singapore, for example, um, when you build out into the ocean, you're using uh, soft material, um, and usually uh, this, these areas are quite prone to quite prone to flooding, um, and also to liquefaction during an earthquake if another hazard were to exist. Um, so here you can see then a, a local temporary patch, and what the Army Corps was trying to do here. Um, this was filled afterwards. This is a repair here, a temporary repair here, okay, uh, to then be able to pump the water out and dry this out. So when the hole was starting to form in the levee, the Army Corps was trying to bring a barge and put the barge in the hole to plug the hole, okay? Uh, but you don't have to be a genius to realize that, that that's called an engineering struggle uh, that usually doesn't work. The barge, uh, the barge went right over uh, the levee through the hole and, uh, and then causes more damage. Um, so when these levees get over top, you get pictures like this, okay? So you're, this is, so Hurricane Katrina is before social media and before smartphones, okay? It came the next year with Twitter in 2006 and then, and then the iPhone in 2007. Um, so but pictures like this were already going around on the internet. So, and then of course people are talking, oh, it's a wall of water, okay? Like a big tsunami coming, right? But when you see things on the internet, you have to be careful. What you're seeing here is basically water going over a levee. Okay, this is just the overflow over the levee and then the flow down the backside. And what you can see, you know, you get a 10 meter, 10 meter kind of scale here in terms of the vertical. So this is pretty brutal. Uh, this is another example here. We have uh, the ocean side and then we have the land side and the levee in between that's been overflown and starting to, to erode here um, in Louisiana. So I've done some experiments uh, when I was an undergrad student, actually, just like you, um, quite some time ago. But uh, um, so you basically had um, so there's these overflow kind of experiments, okay? Um, and usually you get very high velocities when you start to overflow on the backside, and that is then also usually uh, when um, um, is my camera frozen? But can you still hear me? Okay, all right. Okay. Yes. yes. Um, so basically, on the backside, you will get you will get a lot of erosion. And if you don't manage to fill up the backside fast enough, then you will get a breach, okay? So here you can see different stages. Uh, you can see the navigation canal on the left. You can see the levee that breached um, in the background. Okay, this is where the hole is in the levee here, okay? And there's a temporary repair being put in with the earth's instruction here. Uh, but this is where there's a 300 meter hole, okay? 300 meter hole. This barge came through the hole over here. You can see the overflow over the levee, and you can see the uh, you can see the scouring on the back side of the levee here. So you can see the scouring here on the back side, okay, um, before the failure. So then comes the reconstruction. Okay, so most people try to rebuild. Most people go back to the same place they lived before. Most people try to rebuild. So uh, reconstruction was done in a, in a T shape. So instead of having these eye walls, it's now a T wall. So it has sort of a, sort of a collar to protect against the overflow erosion. Uh, and then uh, some of the things that have to be applied here because the soil is very weak. Uh, it takes a lot of anchoring and so forth. It's not just sheep pond to try to keep the thing uh, stable. And uh, they were also raised a little bit. Uh, three years later, next hurricane comes. Uh, system is only partially complete. The same area is uh, water's being pushed up to very high levels. And what happens now is, well, the system's already the limit, okay? So the new system uh, is higher than the old system, uh, but it's called a 100-year risk reduction plan. So note the, the change in words here. It's no longer called a hurricane protection plan. It's now called a hurricane risk reduction plan. So I already know there's a possibility it can fail, okay? So I think as engineers, we have to think about that too. We have to think about the possibility that things are going to be beyond this design and that things might potentially fail. Um, so the water's right to the top here and some water going over the top. And there's only a category one hurricane at, at, at landfall here. Uh, and you can see here water splashing, um, splashing over things as we go. Um, and you can see here the same area where the breach was from before with that bridge in the background. 
and you can kind of see how the old and the new merge together and the system worked okay the houses uh, that were rebuilt on the right side didn't get flooded again yeah. but um barely okay barely okay um vessels also pushed uh, pushed along to uh, uh towards bridges here as you can see and this is essentially the entire the entire city here so you have to think of this uh, <clears throat> like a soup bowl okay you have to think of this literally you have to think of this literally like a soup bowl okay let me see if i can uh, you have to think of this like a soup bowl okay basically the city is lower than sea level and uh and it's surrounded by and it's surrounded by levees okay so um yeah you have to think of this like that now the biggest piece is on the east side so over here uh there's essentially one big uh one big barrier uh being put in uh which is a storm surge barrier which is um tallest structure and um You can see it here, okay. Um, and there are some wetlands, okay, which are there to try to um, reduce the reduce the storm waves. Uh, those wetlands, however, when you look out towards the ocean, um, those wetlands here, those marshy areas, um, unfortunately, are degrading. Okay, so 100 years ago, these used to be much more extensive. Um, these are degrading. Now, in comes a two-kilometer-long barrier here that goes across. Okay, and cost more than one billion dollars, um, seven to eight meters high, uh, trying to close this entrance off um, with with very expensive construction. Okay, so it's a very big investment uh, um, to try to uh, to try to protect against against future storms. Um, so it comes with a huge cost. Okay, um, so building these kind of, building these kind of uh, these kind of barriers. Uh, and the question is, you know, are these are these barriers worth it, or do we have to think of other things? Uh, because it's uh, very expensive. You have to put uh, gates for navigation. Ships have to be able to go in and out. Okay, you have to be able to navigate. Fishermen. The area is famous for fishing. Okay, so um, Louisiana redfish, uh, crabs, um, shrimp, and so on. Some of the biggest shrimp in the world uh, comes from this part uh, uh, of, of Louisiana. A lot of crabs as well. Um, and you need to have passages for fishermen and so forth. So this entire thing um, that only works if you not only have the barriers, um, but you also need um, pump stations. So you see the city in the background and um, you also need pump stations because once you close, um, you know, uh, you have to pump water out on the backside because um, you're below sea level now, okay? Or even if you are not below sea level, but if you only have very little vertical gradient to play with, it will, you will have to pump water out, okay? So when it rains very hard uh, during the storm, uh, you will have to pump the water out or you will drown in your own rain, basically, okay? You will get flooding from the rain. So um, you need pump stations. Uh, likewise, even the sewer, you have to pump it out. Um, so you need very big, very big pump stations. This is one of the largest pump stations in the world. Um, has these huge, uh, has these huge pumps um, that has been built here um, to essentially then pump, uh, pump the water out. So you can see it here. And one of the big challenges, of course, with anything that has to work during a storm is similar to if something has to work during a tsunami, like in Fukushima. You have to make sure um, it's. Uh, you have to make sure uh, you know it doesn't fail, right? So it has to work even uh, even in the flood conditions. So so you need uh, to make sure pumps and so on is are high enough. Well, that's one way to to operate. Okay, you can go this uh, this man-made route. Okay, and once you start, there's no way out. Okay, because uh, the natural delta is gone. Okay, historically the delta would be going back and forth. The river would not be just in one location. Uh, it would go over 100 kilometers in one and in the other direction, and it would deposit a lot of sediment. Now we are number six, okay? Basically the bird foot, the chicken leg, okay? Basically delta, uh, totally artificial. And that's where we are because we have these levees. The, the river cannot go anywhere else unless the levee fail, but also because the infrastructure with the big cities like New Orleans is built where it is, and the port infrastructure is there, people are gonna to try to keep it like that, okay? 
but the system may not work forever. And at some point there may be a, a catastrophic change and the, the, the river might change the course. And uh, there might be a time where some of these places might have to be abandoned, okay? But that can be, that can be uh, 30 years or it might be in 300 years, but we don't know. But um, uh, depending on how things go with sea level rise and with storms and so forth, um, um, things could also be accelerated. <clears throat> now, I want to briefly talk about Asia as well. Um, so, I did some work in Myanmar, um, just to the north of here. Um, if you go on the Islands, you go north, you get to Yangon, and then you have uh, the Irrawaddy Delta, just for scale. The Irrawaddy Delta is the world's largest, one of the world's largest deltas. It's a natural delta. It has many, um, it has many, um, it has many um, um, river mouths. Okay, so it looks totally different to the Mississippi River Delta. I rotate the Myanmar 90 degrees just to, uh, just to line it up here. Uh, so this then to north is to the left here in Myanmar. Um, in terms of fatalities um, in the Bay of Bengal here, and this is kind of uh, also where you are here in Banda Aceh, you are, you are, um, uh, you are in the, uh, you are in the area here uh, at the entrance um, to the Bay of Bengal where you can have storms that start to form, okay? Storms typically start to form about five degrees north, but usually the impacts only start to really happen once you get to 10, uh, 10 degree north um, of, the, um, of, the, um, of the equator or 10 degrees south of the equator. So in Indonesia, chances are uh, that, you're, uh, that, that you're not that much at risk, but uh, we've also seen that some of these storms can form at lower latitudes, uh, due to uh, due to climate change potentially, and that could also mean that you know you might actually see storm impacts in places that you have never seen storm impacts before. And Myanmar's cyclone Nargis here making landfall at 16 degree north here causes 140,000 people to die, which is very similar to what happened down here in 2004 in Banda Aceh in Sumatra. Uh, very similar amount of people actually died uh, from this storm alone. Uh, of course, historically in the last 500 years. Uh, Bangladesh has been the death trap for, for cyclones, um, but with the biggest coastal disasters, uh, three to 500,000 people killed in Cyclone Bola in 1970, but huge investments in evacuation bunkers and so forth, evacuation structures, uh, improved in, uh, evacuation plans and so forth, have been able to reduce, uh, reduce the uh, death tolls in, in, uh, in uh, recent events. Okay. Um, so in Irrawaddy, um, I had a chance to survey there, and the storm size is not that big here, actually. It's on the order of five meters. But uh, the people were not evacuated by the junta at the time, and then this essentially led to, uh, this essentially led to uh, minorities here being trapped um, and, and uh, people dying in, in horribly in the storm, in the storm waves. Uh, it's a very similar situation. You have the Shivagom Pagoda here in Yangon, but then you have some small pagoda that used to be on land here, which is this thing right here. So it looks like a channel marker for navigation, but this used to be a pagoda, okay? And then the coastal erosion essentially leads to, essentially leads to, uh, leads to this kind of scenario here. Um, there's a drinking water well in Myanmar and, um, and it's, uh, it's now part of the beach, okay? So when you have massive coastal erosion, uh, what used to be very dry land, it's completely gone. Now mangroves, um, they can do well in, in storms and in tsunamis, but um, there are limits to that. Okay, if things get too big, things uh, don't turn out so well. You can see here how high, how the high things are. And the other thing is that um, vulnerability is very important. Okay, if you're living one meter below sea level, like here uh, in the Irrawaddy Delta uh, in Myanmar, then you're very vulnerable. Okay, and these houses were washed away. People just rebuild right to the same place, um, in part due to fishing. Now, another thing that I saw when I was going to go to Myanmar was I was going to see a lot of that I was going to see a lot of full-grown mangroves, but I didn't see that many full-grown full mangroves, actually. A lot of mangroves have been cut, okay? So there have been a lot of cutting uh, of, uh, there have been a lot of cutting of mangroves. And this is then what you see when you cut mangroves. Those houses I just showed you with the blue tarp and the white plastic houses back here, they're actually right here. But there used to be mangroves here, but the mangroves were cut for, uh, cooking and so forth, okay, for energy production, uh, for fires, and, and uh, you end up with nothing, okay, your house gets washed away and so forth. So I think reforestation that has been done here in, in Banda Aceh is very nice for, uh, for uh, since the 2004 tsunami. 
And this is an example of Thailand with the reforestation project here. Uh, this was back in 2006 after the Indian Ocean tsunami. Um, but um, we have full grown mangroves here in Aceh. You have much larger projects here. And the last one, and I'll stop, uh, the Philippines uh, with, uh, with Typhoon Haiyan in 2013 um, also leads to large storm surges of you know, the order of eight meters. Uh, and it also um, washes vessels ashore. Now, the other thing is, if you look at this bottom, if you look at this bottom picture here, uh, this vessel is washed ashore. Three months after the, after the typhoon, people are building houses between the ship that was washed ashore and the shoreline, okay? So basically, you already know, where you're building your house, it used to be washed away uh, because even the ship is there now, but you are, you are, um, you are rebuilding right there. And lastly, storms can sometimes also look a little bit like tsunamis. So this is actually a storm surge here. There are some cuts in this video, so it's not a continuous video, but it starts out with you know wind and so forth, and then comes a uh, very fast storm surge, which almost looks like a tsunami. Okay. And then there's a cut here, uh, but then uh, shortly after, actually, it's back to normal. Okay, um, so this gives you gives you an idea of how some of these uh, some of these coastal towns can fare during big storms. Um, and there was a seawall here, down here, actually, this a two meter thing built by Japan, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Japanese inspiration here. But uh, there's a breach in here, okay, and this didn't go so well. You can see this building; the water's all the way to the top here. The roof is still there, and so forth. Okay, um, with that, I will conclude. And um, basically, the size of the storm is very important. Uh, and the wind speed is not necessarily the, the most critical thing when it comes to the damage. Um, and the key measure is still going to be evacuation. Okay, so um, no matter what you're going to, what kind of protective measures you are, we've seen this everywhere. In Japan, for the Indian Ocean, for the Japan tsunami, we've seen this uh, uh, for tsunamis around the world. You can build as many seawalls and as many levees as you want. But um, chances are that something will go wrong somewhere. Okay, there's going to be a hole, a breach somewhere. Uh, engineer, I'm a civil engineer. I believe in civil engineering structures, but I also know that they can fail. Okay, so I think it's very important uh, uh, that you know that you emphasize that people should evacuate and follow evacuation orders. That applies to hurricanes, storms, but also to tsunamis, but also to flash floods from from inland flooding, for example. Um, when it comes to protective structures. I think it's important that we think about uh, multi-hazards, uh, that we think about you know, land level. So land can sink, it can subside. It can subside co-seismically during an earthquake. That's part of what happens also, uh, happened also in Indonesia, but you can also have, or Japan, but you can also have land go sink just due to um, gradual thinking, okay? So subsidence is uh, essentially geotechnical thinking, consolidation. That's what's happening in Jakarta. Okay, you're basically thinking. The land is sinking. You have a huge city with a lot of people and the land is sinking and the sea level is rising. So you can kind of see where things are going there. Um, and so you have to think about multi-hazards for shelters and evacuation buildings. I think it's important that they have sort of multiple hazards and they also serve uh, and that they also serve um, uh, multiple purposes. And with that, um, this is a picture from Myanmar. It just shows you it's always important to talk to the people that you learn a lot um, from them. And with that, I will leave, uh, open the floor for questions. Thank you. Or pass it on to the next speaker, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Herman, for a very good and interesting presentation. Uh, I myself learned uh, a lot of things from what you have done in several places and from uh, other events outside of uh, tsunami here in Aceh. So, uh, yes. Demikian Bapak Ibu sekalian, uh, uh, mahasiswa yang sudah hadir, uh, akhir dari presentasi dari Prof. Herman Fritz, kalau ada yang ingin bertanya, saya persilakan untuk raise hand dan unmute uh, mikrofonnya. Uh, Bapak Ibu dan mahasiswa boleh bertanya dalam bahasa Indonesia, nanti saya akan terjemahkan ke bahasa Inggris. So you can ask in either in bahasa or in English. Uh, anyone, please?
I can see that sama uh, saya dapat melihat di sini ada Bapak Ibu dari BPBD juga. Bisa. Uh, probably I I will start the question from my side, Herman. Um, yeah, about the impacts of the landslide uh, and coupled with impacts of sea level rise. Do we have any uh, technology to mitigate impact uh, from those two events? Because we have a number of coastal cities, for example, Jakarta, Samarang, uh, they are not only prone to sea level rise, but also they are sinking because of the land subsidence. So probably you can share with us uh, certain technology or certain method to mitigate those uh, two events. <laughs> okay, can somebody mute himself? Okay, so uh, generally speaking, uh, so generally speaking, in terms of uh, subsidence, um, the main the main issue is that that usually you need new usually you need new sediments to to be deposited. So historically, it has basically meant that. Oh, okay. okay, so so historically historically has meant that you know the Mississippi River would bring the sediments and would deposit them, and in each flood, the river would bring new sediments. So you're basically like, uh, like basically like a pancake. You put new material, new layers of material periodically on top, and you rebuild the sediment, right? You rebuild the sinking sediment, and the delta keeps growing. That's basically what happens in natural deltas, uh, like in Myanmar, okay? Which is a good example, uh, which is one of the very healthy deltas that bring the river brings a lot of new sediment. Um, now the Mississippi also is like that, basically, but but uh, because it's been put inside these channels. Now the river takes all the sediment and deposits it into the ocean. And then it goes to the deep part of the ocean, it's gone. Okay, so then there's no new material added. Um, so that's usually what happens when you build a city on top. So then basically you have development and then you, you inhibit any new sediment accumulation basically on top. So there's not a natural delta anymore. And then basically what it means is that the land will start to sink with the more things you put on top. So if you put buildings on top, there's weight. Okay, with more weight on top, your land will start to sink even more. Okay, and then usually what plays in places like Venice, in places like Shanghai, in places like Jakarta, in places like New Orleans, is then the other thing, which is uh, extraction of uh, drinking water. So usually from groundwater, you pump, you pump groundwater to get uh, water for drinking, water to take a shower, and so forth. And then with that, you further lower the water table, but you also bring the land down consolidation in the same process. Um, so in Venice, for example, the pumping in Venice, Italy, for example, the pumping of, uh, of drinking water had to be stopped to save the old buildings from sinking even further. Uh, when it comes to trying to when it comes to trying to um, protect, then you have a couple of options. You have the option of building levees, building seawalls and so forth, barriers around it. That's what's been done in the Netherlands, what's been done in Japan, uh, what's been done in China, what's been done in what's been done in New Orleans. And the only other alternative is, uh, is to try to, uh, try to pump things back into the ground. Okay, so, so what you do in the oil industry, when you extract, you actually pump something else in behind it, right? So you, you uh, um, which is usually some kind of a slurry, which is a water and sediment kind of mix uh, that you pump in when you extract the oil um, to, to try to keep things stable. Um, the problem with that is uh, when you try to do this large scale, it becomes very, it becomes very expensive. It gets very difficult. And then trying to, trying to with hydraulic jacking, trying to, uh, trying to raise the city again, uh, that has been discussed after Hurricane Katrina for New Orleans. Uh, there were papers written about this, trying to inject material in the subsurface and trying to raise the whole city, okay? Um, the idea was dismissed because the problem is when you try to inject this stuff, it's, it's not going to be so easy. It's not going to go up like an elevator, okay? This might work for individual buildings, okay? Trying to raise one building or push one small area, you know, up by injecting material from below. 
Uh, but but for large scale, I think uh, you will end up with differential problems, uh, higher in one side, lower on the other, buildings crumbling and so forth. So, so this has, for example, been rejected in places like Venice and New Orleans because the old buildings will collapse and part of what makes those cities beautiful is, is their historic, uh, historic buildings. So those are gonna be big challenges. I don't think there's any easy solution. So at some point, you know, once you run out of levees and seawalls, you're probably gonna be stuck uh, thinking about relocation at some point. Okay, so, but that is, uh, that is very unpopular. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, uh, that is, uh, uh, will trigger another kind of question about Jakarta itself, you know. Yeah, well, you understand that uh, our uh, new capital is now is uh, on underway uh, in Kalimantan because one of the reasons because of the sinking problem uh, that Jakarta is facing right now. Uh, so we don't have any uh, good solution to mitigate the impact of the sinking the land subsidence uh, and also the impact of sea level rise. So that's one of the reason motivate uh, the re relocation of the capital city of Indonesia. Do you have any opinion on the, on the new capital city of Indonesia? Well, I, 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 I have no idea about the new capital of Indonesia. So I don't really, I can't, I can't say much about that, but I can say I visited Myanmar when the junta was still in place. Okay, I visited Myanmar where it was very difficult to access Myanmar. There were only 3,000 visitors per year going to Myanmar in 2008. So, and that was one of them. Uh, now there are 300,000 visitors going to Myanmar every year. So, so Myanmar actually did this exercise uh, with Natavidya. Um, the primary reason there was actually that the junta, I think, uh, the junta was scared of the people. So then basically they decided to, to move, to relocate, to relocate the capital uh, inland in a new city, um, basically away from protests or chance of, you know, being overturned as a government, uh, which of course is uh, not a good situation. Uh, but but the, uh, the problem with that city is it's, it's quite remote. Um, there are huge highways being built. And those highways are almost empty, you know. So it's uh, it's 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 a new city being built uh, in the middle of nowhere. Um, now, obviously, when you are so that would be a bad example, but it's also a relatively recent example, and it's politically driven, also, which may also be another reason why it's bad. There are other countries that move their capital. Okay, the United States uh, originally was uh, one of them was Philadelphia. Okay, uh, and it basically moved from Philadelphia to Washington D.C. Washington DC today, most people that visit from around the world think it's a very beautiful city, or at least the Capitol Park with the mall and so forth is actually very beautiful. Um, other examples are Brazil and South America, you know, so the capital was moved to Brasilia in the, uh, in the Amazon jungle, basically going, going inland and a completely new city was designed by Oscar Niemeyer, famous architect. Um, and one can debate, you know, how is the outcome? Um, usually governments try to do that when they try to remove, when they try to remove, separate economic capitals like New York or so uh, in the United States uh, from the political capital like Washington, D.C. Um, or, um, or, or Rio in Brazil uh, to, uh, to Brasilia and try to develop and, and try to develop new parts of a country. OK, so that trying to you know, develop the Amazon area and put the capital there. Uh, so that comes with uh, comes with challenges. So that's all I can say to that. Uh, the situation in Indonesia is something that I'm I have not been to Kalimantan, so I cannot really speak of that uh, uh, directly. Obviously, I see the challenges uh, the challenges of Jakarta because Jakarta has unfortunately been built colonized by the Dutch, and uh, and the Dutch are used to living like that. But their situation is also not very good because the entire country is also sinking. Okay, the Netherlands is sinking. So, you know, in the next 300 years, it's also not so clear how things will look in the, will look there. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, Herman. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, comment on that. So I would like to invite other uh, participants if they have any thoughts or anything that you would like to share uh, or want to ask to Professor Herman. You can raise your hand or you un can unmute your microphone. Bapak Ibu, uh, mahasiswa sekalian, jika ada yang ingin bertanya, silakan. Saya dapat uh, nanti memfasilitasi juga kalau ingin ditranslate ke bahasa Inggris. 
Assalamualaikum Pak Sanus Sidik, izin boleh tanya? Yes, silakan. Uh, izin boleh pakai bahasa aja ya Pak? Baik, saya langsung. Uh, uh, saya ingin menanyakan kalau dalam mungkin kont... perkenalkan diri dulu oh. berapa ibu? Baik, saya Fadliani dari Maliku Saleh, Maliku City. Okay. Uh, uh, jadi kalau terkait dengan uh, kondisi land use change di upstreamnya catchment, land use change pada upstream catchment itu berpengaruh tidak uh, terhadap apa sedimen apa tadi sedimen rep Ah, sedimen okay. di apa ya di pantai ya pembaharuan sedimen di muara. Ah, okay. di muara ah, di pantai. Terima kasih itu saja. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi okay. wabarakatuh. So uh, Profesor Herman, the, there is a question from uh, Ibu Fadliani, a lecturer from Universitas uh, Maliku Saleh here in Lo Samawi uh, about uh, 300 km to the eastern part of uh, Banda Aceh. So she asked about uh, the impacts of the land use change at the upstream parts of uh, a catchment area, whether that will give influence to a sediment budget or sediment uh, transport around river mount or, or, or delta. Do you have any comments on that? Please. Yeah, this is, a, this is an excellent question. Um, so obviously, obviously the... Um, things have to be managed okay so it's uh, and there is not just the flooding from the ocean there is also the flooding from rainfall okay so during hurricanes for example we can get we can get in a 24-hour period we can get you know half a meter of rainfall okay that's a lot of water that will that will flow from the land side as well okay so you have uh, you have the uh, inland flooding uh, which is also very important and that caused a lot of problems in the United States as well, because during Hurricane Harvey in Houston, Texas, for example, most of the flooding was inland, actually, just because the storm was parked, the water could not escape out into the ocean, and there was so much rain being dumped inland that then large parts of Houston flooded, okay? Um, so in terms of, in terms of uh, um, water resources management, the, the entire watershed, of course, has to be analyzed and has to be managed. So if you have a steep terrain, then it's very critical how, how that water flows and how that water is managed and how quickly you're bringing all the water through a watershed. So do you have some, some way to slow the flooding down? Can you, uh, because it's not gonna rain forever, right? It's gonna rain for a couple of days at best. Um, so at some point it's gonna stop. So if you, if you can retard, if you can slow down the process of that water uh, going to, to the river mouse, um, with catchments and so forth, then you get better use of the water. Uh, you can use the water for, for agriculture and so forth, rather than dumping all the water uh, in, a, in a flash flood situation uh, very quickly. Um, so, so those are those are the water resources challenges. Um, and then of course, they, they, they also get challenged uh, with uh, what happens with the river mouse. Um, so the water management is one side, but the other one you mentioned is sediment. And that is, of course, they kind of go against each other because then if you try to hold water back, usually also means you're holding sediment back. So you're preventing the flash flood, but at the same time, you're also capturing the sediment somewhere else, uh, um, which basically means that in the river mouse, in the delta area where the water goes into the ocean, uh, you get less sediment, okay? And that can also have effects on beaches because if you don't supply enough sediment in the rivers, uh, you get less, you know, you're going to, you're going to have less, uh, less sand there, for example. Okay. So, um, and the, and the Delta might not be able to, might not be able to, to rebuild itself, uh, rebuild itself naturally. So those are, uh, those are all conflicting, uh, conflicting challenges, uh, and they all play together. Okay. So it's really the entire watershed management from, from the mountains to the rivers, uh, to the river mouths, to the coast, um, it, they all interplay. Um, and then, of course, sea level rise will bring the sea level up along the shoreline, and that will slow the outflow from the river, uh, will, which will increase the potential for flooding in, in flat areas. Okay, so flat areas like north of Jakarta and so forth, you're going to increase your deteriorate your situation as the land sinks and the sea level goes up. Uh, uh, the situation will get worse and worse with flooding, uh, um, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Thank you, Herman. Uh, Bu Fadlian, apakah perlu ditranslate atau ada komen lanjutan? Uh, terima kasih, Pak. Tidak perlu ditranslate. 
Oke, okay, terima kasih banyak. Thank you, Prof. Silakan Bapak Ibu yang lain. Baik, silakan Bapak Ibu yang lain ada yang ingin bertanya, Bapak komentar. Uh, I don't see any All right, I don't see any uh, participant raise hand and uh, do we have questions from uh, the YouTube uh, link? Because I cannot see the song. Apakah ada yang uh, bertanya di link YouTube uh, Pak Ibrahim atau Panitia? No? Tidak ada. Di link YouTube ada yang bertanya nggak? Belum ada. Oke. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Professor Herman. So we all uh, glad to to know and to learn about uh, what you have shared with us. Um, I check uh, that we have here 100 participants, and we have uh, how many? About uh, 55 participants at the YouTube link. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Now uh, we go uh, next to the second speakers. Uh, uh, Bapak Dr. Benazir, are you here? Yes, Prof. Samsidi. Uh, sud sudah ini ya, sudah jadi co-host ya? Belum. Ya? Belum. Oh, belum. Okay. Uh, all right. So we go to the next uh, speaker, uh, who is Dr. Benazir from Universitas Gajah Mada. Uh, please, someone show uh, Dr. Benazir's CV. So I would like to read uh, the brief CV. Sorry, uh, someone need to mute. Okay. All right. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Dr. Benazir is a lecturer at the Department of Civil and, and Environmental Engineering from Tasca Jamada. So since 2022 up to 2024, uh, he became an administrator of PARPI. PARPI is Indonesian Association of Coastal Engineering Experts. Uh, he's also an administrator of Central Hati, which is Indonesian Hydraulic Engineering Expert Association. Uh, he will have this position until 2023. Uh, number of research been conducted by Dr. Ben Nazir, uh, for example, development of soft structure, peace, tsunami mitigation with an overview of environment and social aspects. So without further ado, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ben Nazir to share his presentation. Uh, probably this will be mostly in Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, I will later on summarize at the end of uh, his presentation uh, to the audience. That's all. So I'll give uh, the Zoom to you, uh, Benazir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Sam Siddiq. Uh, before that, I want to send my honor to uh, Studio Mercy staff, especially for uh, Professor Sam Siddiq, uh, uh, as, as director of TDMRC, and then also our staff that prepared this uh, session. And also my honor from uh, to Prof. Herman Fries. Uh, last we met uh, in Yogyakarta around uh, 2018 maybe, in the HR EPD in Yogyakarta. And then uh, I would like to uh, maybe deliver my presentation about the coastal engineering. But the, this program is especially for the world class professor, but I want to clarify uh, something that I not professor yet here. So, and my presentation is also uh, not globally le like the presentation of uh, from uh, Professor Fris. And then I prefer to pres present this uh, material by Bahasa. Thank you. Ya, yeah, uh, baik uh, untuk sesi ini, saya akan coba mendelivery sedikit tentang uh, uh, 
uh, teknik pantai, terutama tentang uh, skopnya, skop teknik pantai maupun potensi yang ada, uh, dan juga beberapa hal yang isu terkait dengan teknik pantai. Nah, di sini kemarin juga Prof. Sidik mengatakan jangan terlalu ke uh, apa namanya ke teknis, jadi kita meninggalkan rumus-rumus yang cacing-cacing dulu, jadi fokus kepada overview saja. Baik untuk hari ini, Bapak Ibu sekalian dan mahasiswa, ini adalah empat hal bagian yang akan kita uraikan hari ini. Yang pertama adalah scope dan overview. Di sini ada potensi maupun sedikit tentang beberapa sejarah yang sudah ada tentang dari pantai, dahulu kala, dan juga tentang permasalahan-permasalahan dalam desain maupun akibat alam yang bencana yang terjadi banyak di terutama di Indonesia karena case yang kita anggap lah case lokal. Jadi Prof Herman Kris itu lebih banyak ke global karena pengalamannya lebih banyak. Nah di sini khusus lokal gitu. Nah juga ada nanti kita singgung sedikit uh, tentang uh, apa namanya coastal green infrastructure ini khusus untuk uh, hutan pantai saja yang sudah ada di kita Indonesia. Kemudian nanti di sini sedikit. Uh, baik untuk yang uh, Bagian pertama itu, kenapa teknik pantai itu sangat berperan? Yang pertama adalah kita memang masyarakat lebih dominan, walaupun lebih banyak secara peradaban juga terlihat bahwasanya tinggalnya itu di teknik pantai, di pantai ya, di kawasan pantai. Nah, sehingga berinteraksi langsung terhadap gelombang maupun kondisi-kondisi hidro oseanografis yang terjadi di pesisir. Nah, kemudian juga terdapat beberapa bangunan ataupun fasilitas uh, publik yang dibangun memang di kosta area, apalagi dengan kita itu sebagai negara kepulauan, nah, di mana kota-kota maupun daerah-daerah kita tingkat 2 dan tingkat 1 itu banyak di uh, kepulauan. Kemudian permasalahannya itu kadang juga muara sungai itu dijadikan sebagai alur pelayaran yang di mana di dalamnya itu terdapat pelabuhan itu menghindari uh, konstruksi uh, pelabuhan yang memang dilepas pantai terkait dengan keamanan. Nah selanjutnya itu dari dalam teknik pantai itu sendiri kita bisa mempelajari lebih lanjut dan kemudian menjadi sebuah penanganan untuk bencana-bencana besar seperti tadi ada hurricane, storm surge maupun tsunami. Jadi sifatnya itu memitigasi. Nah, kalau kita lihat dari uh, sejarah, karena bagaimanapun uh, ini ada pepatah uh, pepatah uh, Jawa ya mengatakan bahwasanya uh, budaya itu adalah sebuah cerminan besar terhadap peradaban suatu bangsa. Jadi kalau kita lihat uh, sejarah membaca sejarah itu uh, pantai dunia maritim itu sudah lama dimanfaatkan. Ini kerajaan Sriwijaya yang berpusat di Palembang itu sudah menggunakan transportasi laut untuk bisa mengekspansi, memperluas kawasan, kemudian juga terkait dengan perdagangan dan lainnya. Nah, lebih ini lagi, lebih mudah lagi, kerajaan Aceh kalau kita lihat juga beberapa kota besar itu juga terletaknya itu di pesisir. Kemudian Banda Aceh. Aceh, kemudian Samudra Pasai itu mempunyai peradaban sendiri dan perlah yang di pesisir Aceh Timur. Nah kalau kita lihat ini lukisan, lukisan karena dulu pun belum ada drone, jadi ini lukisan. Ini menggambarkan bahwa transportasi air itu sudah itu, terutama untuk di kawasan pantai, di mana memanfaatkan sungai sebagai alur pelayaran. Nah dari sini kalau kita melihat lagi bahwasanya pantai itu punya potensi yang cukup uh, unik dan memang ada di mana dikatakan ada tiga uh, potensi itu untuk kawasan pantai yang pertama adalah potensinya itu dapat diperbaharui. Nah, dapat diperbaharui di sini dalam artian uh, ketika dia dikonsumsikan uh, ataupun dimanfaatkan tapi punya butuh waktu untuk bisa kembali bisa dimanfaatkan. Ya, contohnya misalkan terumbu karang. Nah, ketika terumbu karang itu uh, 
mati, dia itu akan butuh waktu untuk bisa tumbuh lagi. Begitu juga misalkan seperti ini, ini di Langsa ya, waktu di Langsa, ada hutan mangrove. Kalau hutan mangrove ini suatu hari perlu direvitalisasi, direvitalisasi, nah dia butuh waktu, butuh waktu sekian tahun untuk dia bisa tumbuh lebat lagi seperti itu. Nah kemudian kalau melihat uh, yang tidak bisa diperbaharui itu banyak, ya, terutama terkait dengan mineral, ya, gas bumi dan sebagainya, oil dan sebagainya. Nah selain itu uh, potensinya itu ada pada jasa lingkungan. Jasa lingkungan di sini ya kita bisa memanfaatkan pantai itu untuk rekreasi. Misalkan pada gambar ini kalau kita lihat ini di lampu di Aceh ya, di Aceh besar lampu. Ini pantai yang cukup indah bisa dimanfaatkan untuk rekreasi. Nah, maka dari itu untuk menjaga potensi-potensi yang ini diperlukan beberapa rekayasa. Rekayasa ini yang disebut dengan teknik atau rekayasa pantai. Nah, kalau kita lihat lebih global lagi, sudah banyak sebenarnya kota-kota besar di dunia yang memang berada di pesisir. Kalau kita lihat di sini, di Australia ada, ya, di Hawaii, Brazil, dan sebagainya. Dan di Indonesia sendiri, ini ada eh, banyak sebenarnya. Ini salah satunya adalah Tandu Benoa di Bali. Kita lihat eh, bahwasanya hmm, kotanya itu cukup eh, alami, di mana di pesisir itu juga sudah ada penanganan terkait dengan gelombang ada beberapa bangunan struktur pantai di sini. Nah, dalam hal uh, teknik pantai di sini kita ada terminologi yang memang untuk mempelajari uh, uh, karakteristik daripada teknik pantai. Yang pertama itu kita bisa lihat pada gambar di atas bahwasanya teknik pantai itu uh, pantai itu terdiri dari kalau dalam hal kajian itu adalah littoral zone akan dibagi jadi offshore dan nearshore maupun shore sendiri. Nah, terkait dengan e, kawasan pemukiman kita banyak di sini, makanya berinteraksi langsung dengan daerah kustal, gitu. daerah kusnya. Nah, ini nanti akan dipelajari mulai dari e, pembangkitan gelombang, mulai dari laut dalam, kemudian kejalaran, sampai dengan deformasi deformasi gelombang yang nanti berubah selama dia merambat dan tiba di daratan. Nah, dari segi pengelolaan ini sebenarnya bisa disederhanakan lagi variabel-variabel ini, di mana nanti dibagi antara pantai, sepadan pantai, dan perairan pantai. Pantai itu sendiri sebenarnya ada batas, yaitu di mana muka air paling surut terhadap dengan muka air pasang tertinggi gitu. Maksud. Nah itu kawasan pantai. Sedangkan sempadan adalah bagian hulunya, hulunya daripada pantai yang biasanya di sini akan dimanfaatkan sebagai barrier natural barrier ataupun green protection nanti misalkan ada di sini hutan, hutan alami maupun sendun dan sebagainya walaupun kalau di kota-kota ataupun area yang pemukiman cukup padat ini bahkan eh, apa, dibangun area hunian dan area industri dan sebagainya nah pesisir itu ada batas terkait dengan kontur Nah, itu adalah uh, cakupan ataupun global umum secara untuk teknik pantai. Nah, sekarang di pantai itu sendiri terjadinya sering terjadinya isu. Isu itu artinya problem, ada masalah baik itu uh, akibat turun tangannya manusia dalam hal peningkatan tadi maupun akibat alam itu sendiri. Jadi kalau kita lihat misalkan ini uh, coba saya contohkan biar menggunakan uh, uh, di Aceh ya. Di Aceh kita punya uh, apa namanya uh, pantai uh, Lampu, ya pantai Lampu itu memang cukup indah. Kalau di Bali itu punya Kuta, di Lombok punya Kuta, ya di Banda Aceh di Aceh itu punya Lampu pasir putih. Nah di sini itu dibangun uh, pelabuhan tujuan itu perikanan. Jadi untuk untuk nelayan. Tapi sebelum kita ke situ, saya ingin menunjukkan dulu kondisi lampunya itu bagian yang dibangun nanti di sini, yang ada eh, apa namanya jangkar ini. Ini nanti jadi dermaga. Ya. Jadi ini kondisi sebelum dibangun dan jauh sebelum tsunami tahun 2003. Eh, yang ini ini adalah eh, karang karang alami 
kalau kita lihat dari uh, view di atas inilah pecah itu menandakan bahwa di sini ada karang dengan kedalaman yang sudah dangkal. Jadi gelombang sudah pecah duluan sebelum tiba di uh, garis pantai. Jadi ada proteksi alami. Nah, tujuannya itu nanti di sini mau dibangun pelabuhan perikanan. Itu bisa menambah kapal-kapal kemudian lokal. Karena saat ini nelayan lokal ini menggunakan uh, tradisional karena kapal itu ditarik ke darat ya, ke perahu kecil. Nah, kalau yang ini memang uh, sengaja kita tampilkan, ini adalah kondisi saat tsunami, jadi hancur total 2005 Januari, hancur total. Nah, tetapi ini pulih. Kalau kita lihat pulih, dia pulih secara alami. Tahun 2009 dia sudah kembali dari pantainya. Sudah pulih secara alami. Pasirnya masih tetap putih. Nah, ini adalah beberapa bulan sebelum dibangun. Dibangunnya itu adalah berupa lengan berwater, satu lengan, konektif ke darat. Ini sebelum dibangun, pada Maret 2017, kita lihat tidak ada banyak, tidak ada perubahan. Perubahan pantai masih mengalami hal yang sama masih alami ya tidak ada perubahan terkait dengan garis pantainya maupun pergerakan sedimennya. Nah kalau kita lihat lagi ini adalah setelah dibangun ini sudah dibangun Oktober 2017 ini lengannya bapak ibu ini lengannya satu lengan satu lengan menuju ke dari selatan ini kemudian sampai ke barat ya jadi terbuka itu di sini nelayan itu alur pelayaran itu nanti lewat sini dan menambat di sini gitu. Nah, tetapi pantai itu merespon ketika ini dibangun. Kalau kita lihat di sini ada pergerakan yang agak condong. Tapi ini bisa kita lihat lebih lanjut di 2018. Kalau kita lihat garis pantai semakin maju 2018 ini. Nah, ini menandakan bahwa pantai itu merespon terhadap costal structure yang sudah dibangun. Nah, kalau kita lihat lebih jauh lagi 2019 ini semakin dekat dengan water Sedangkan nah, di 2020 dia itu sudah itu ya, ini sudah ketemu antara uh, daratan dengan apa namanya berwater atau pemecah gelombang. Jadi yang awal tujuannya itu sebagai kolam labu sekarang menjadi daratan. Jadi kalau kita lihat dari kalau kita tidak tahu ini bangunannya di perundukan atau apa ini seolah-olah adalah area reklamasi dan tujuannya itu melindungi pasir yang masuk ke sini. Nah, walaupun tujuan sebenarnya bukan itu. Dan di 2022 untuk menanggulangi ini itu dipotong bagian sini dipotong tetapi itu tidak berhasil ya. Dan itu tidak berhasil. Nah, kalau kita lihat 2020 itu saya ke ke sana ya, meninjau melihat sambil jalan-jalan. Eh -jalan. uh, 2020 kondisinya seperti ini. Area birunya itu adalah yang ini ya. Jadi memang murni sudah daratan dan sudah ditumbuhi oleh vegetasi. Sedangkan inilah view breakwater-nya yang merah. Ini dermaga. Ini kita berdiri di atas ini mengambil foto. Jadi memang tidak ada lagi. Nah, ini dipotong di sini 2021 sudah mulai dipotong. Nah, tetapi tidak bisa langsung walaupun ini sudah dikeruk tapi tidak bisa langsung membentuk kolam lagi. Kenapa? Karena ini aktif ya. Ini aktif. Ini akan ada yang namanya kalau di teknik pantai adalah longshore transport. Nah, makanya dalam membangun sebuah pelabuhan itu kajiannya itu bukan hanya dari gelombang, tapi juga ada pengaruh sedimen, tinjauan terhadap sedimentasi. Nah, ini adalah salah satu permasalahan sedimentasi. Kemudian kita lihat sisi lawannya yaitu erosi. Ini saya ambil contoh lagi di Nias. Nias, Sumatera Utara. Itu ada pantai di desa Teluk Belukar, masih kecamatan Gunung Sitoli. Pantai bentuk padanya seperti ini, di mana ini ada juga untuk perikanan, ada dermaga tipe jeti. Dan di sini itu ada sebuah bangunan. Kalau kita lihat, di sini membentuknya seperti lurus saja, tegak lurus terhadap garis pantai. Nah, manfaatnya belum tahu waktu itu kita ke sana 2019. Nah, ini kalau memang tujuannya sebagai breakwater mungkin ini belum selesai. Mungkin pembangunannya bertahap. Tapi kalau tujuannya untuk growing, ya kalau growing cuma satu satu tegak seperti ini ya mungkin tidak efektif ya. Nah, konsekuensinya apa? Kalau kita lihat ini adalah bangunan coastal structure-nya. 
kita tidak memberi namanya apa karena belum tahu secara fungsi. Ada dari batu gunung, kemudian uh, sisi selatannya kalau kita lihat ini sudah diproteksi dan proteksi itu hancur. Jadi sejarahnya itu pertama itu dibangun adalah jadi dan tidak ada apa-apa ya, kita lihat. Kemudian dibangun uh, coastal structure ini, kemudian ini bagian ini mengalami erosi, bagian selatan ini mengalami erosi kehilangan sedimen. Nah, karena ini mulai kehilangan sedimen, di sini ada ada dermaga, kemudian ada fasilitas pelabuhan, maka dibangun seawall. Nah, saat kita ke sana, seawallnya ini sudah hancur. Eh? Karena memang sedimen di sini terangkat, terambil, dan dia guling, kemudian patah terhadap serangan gelombang. Nah, ini adalah uh, dermaganya, jetinya, itu juga sudah putus. Nah, walaupun masih bisa dilewati, tapi sebenarnya sudah agak putus. Dan ini adalah seawall yang sisi selatan. Waktu kita ke sana sudah ada, tapi sudah mulai agak rusak juga. Bagian top proteksinya itu juga mulai terjadi rusak. Ruang terbuka, ruang terbuka, atau ruang Sumatera. Nah, di sini kalau kita telusuri, ini adalah aerial view dari 2002, yaitu saat belum dibangun apa-apa, kondisi pantai masih alami. Dan ini 2014 sudah dibangun jeti. Jetinya itu dari tiang pancang, jadi dia tidak mengganggu proses di bawah. Sedimen masih bisa lewat longsor karen masih bisa lewat ya. Nah, kemudian juga tidak berubah apa-apa 2014. Dan di 2015 sudah dibangun kosta struktur ini dan agak sedikit eh, merespon ya pantainya. Kalau kita lihat lebih jauh 2017 itu responnya semakin besar. Di mana sisi selatan itu tergerus. Sisi selatan daripada kosta struktur ini tergerus. Nah, kalau kita kompilasi ini ada eh, foto terbaru 2021 yang merah garisnya seperti ini. Ini adalah berdasarkan sesaat ya, karena memang sangat manual, tidak ada analisis GIS. Jadi langsung manual dengan view dari satelit, kita tarik polyline-nya seperti ini. Ini seperti ini. Nah, sampai sini adalah seawall tadi. Nah, di sini tanpa seawall mulai lebih dalam lagi dan semakin terus. Kalau dibandingkan dengan 2002, ini sudah mengalami banyak banyak kehilangan darah. Nah, konsekuensinya apa? Ini adalah jalan nasional, jalan provinsi. Bisa saja nanti area rawa ataupun ini danau, danau Teluk Belukar ini akan menjadi laut. Akan menjadi laut sehingga nanti garis pantainya akan di sini. Itu konsekuensi yang dibikin jika tidak ditangani secepatnya. Nah, baik. Itu adalah erosi yang memang akibat ada campur tangan kita ya dalam tujuannya itu sebenarnya untuk memanfaatkan uh, sumber daya. Nah, selain itu, kalau kita lihat lebih detail kondisi tadi itu, ini ada perubahan. Kalau di tani pantai ini disebut deformasi gelombang. Ini adalah garis puncak gelombang. Ketika dia tiba menuju daratan, dia kan akan pecah sejajar pantai. Nah, tapi akan ada pengaruh daripada kosta struktur ini tadi, ada tentunya pembelokan. Atau nanti disebut dengan diffraction. Ada diffraksi. Kalau kita lihat gelombangnya, Uh, ini adalah video ya. Kalau kita lihat berdua seperti ini, ini yang diambil. Nah, konsekuensi konsekuensi ini memang. Dalam mendesain sebuah pusta structure. Nah, ini kondisi window di sana memang dominan dari utara. Dari utara untuk gelombangnya, arah gelombangnya. Baik, yang alami juga terjadi sebenarnya. Ini disingkir, terjadi abrasi. Itu karena pengaruh iklim dan juga pengaruh daripada hidroseanografinya. Tetapi di, di kalau di, kita bicara singkir itu juga ada konsekuensi lain, yaitu ada lens subsidence. Jadi ada penurunan, penurunan muka tanah yang berparah kejadian ini. Nah, kalau di pesisir selatan Jawa, ini memang kejadian yang sangat, sangat uh, alami di sana. Justru kalau diproteksi, uh, butuh perhati, apa butuh sangat hati-hati. Kenapa? Ini nanti akan kembali, akan kembali. Kalau selatan Jawa akan seperti itu, akan kembali. Karena memang di sana gelombang cukup tinggi dan longsor karunnya itu uh, cukup besar, yang bisa menetransportnya itu cukup besar sampai 
berapa juta dalam uh, setahun gitu. Nah ini tergerus di sana alami. Nah kemudian kita pindah kembali ke alam. Ini kasus uh, di Nias juga, tapi ini akibat gempa 2005. 2005 gempa di Nias itu kebanyakan daratan itu terangkat sehingga di sana ada terumbu karang ataupun disebut ada beberapa pulau baru itu muncul. Jadi ada area yang uplift, ada area yang downlift. Garis biru ini adalah area yang downlift. Jadi ini bagian yang uh, turun ya, pohon tanah yang turun. Yang sedangkan ini yang naik gitu. Ada yang sampai 2,5 meter naiknya. Nah contohnya seperti ini. Nah ini di Nias, uh, jadi ada dua pulau itu sebelumnya itu masih satu pulau sendiri-sendiri. Ketika setelah gempa itu terangkat dan menyatu gitu. Konsekuensinya apa ke fasilitas kita, fasilitas pantai kita? Tentunya ini. Jadi ada e, pelabuhan dengan jetty terangkat juga, sehingga fungsionalnya itu tidak bisa digunakan lagi. Nah, ini sudah jadi kedalaman itu sudah terbatas, jadi sudah gagal untuk ya, digunakan. Nah, selanjutnya itu ini juga lagi e, cukup hot isu terutama terakhir di Pantura dan juga di ibu kota. Sebenarnya ini juga terjadi di kalau Rob ya, Rob itu banjir pantai, banjir laut. E, terjadi juga di Sumatera Utara, Kalimantan Utara juga terjadi. Ya, pengaruh utamanya adalah e, perubahan iklim, kemudian e, juga land subsiden dan juga e, mencairnya kutub ya, kutub es di utara. Ini saya contohkan. E, di ibu kota DKI Jakarta Jakarta Utara kita visit ke sana tahun lalu kita lihat bahwasanya uh, dari ini saja kalau kita lihat ini di Muara Angke Jakarta Utara dari sini saja ini kampung nelayan terlihat bahwasanya ada elevasi penampakan elevasi tembok laut nah, berarti kan menandakan bahwa yang sebelumnya itu sudah tidak bisa mengcover daripada muka air laut ini. Kalau kita di sini itu tinggi lebih tinggi permukaan air laut daripada daratan. Jadi setandanya tidak ada tembok ini ya langsung ke pemukiman ya, pemukiman warga. Nah di sini juga kita memodelkan beberapa skenario dengan debit sekian, kemudian dengan kondisi hidrosenografi bahwasanya jika tidak ditanggulangi ke kalau kita bilang e, DKI tenggelam itu memang berita media ya, tapi secara e, rekayasa pantai itu terjadi akan adanya genangan di pesisir itu sampai yang kalau kita digambar ini yang 3 meter itu yang merah sekitar 3 meter, sedangkan yang orange itu sekitar lebih dari 3 meter ya kalau yang merah itu, sedangkan dari yang sedang itu yang orange itu 1 sampai 3 meter. Jadi memang rendamannya itu di pesisir utara Jakarta. Karena memang di sana subsidinya juga tinggi. Nah, kemudian, ini 25 tahun ya, tidak sekarang. Jadi kondisi ke depan dengan skenario tidak ditanggulang. Nah, update sekarang itu, Jakarta kan sedang uh, menyelesaikan pembangunan uh, SIDAC ataupun SeaWall NCICD. Ya. Jadi ada giant SeaWall di sepanjang pesisir ini, walaupun belum selesai semua. Tapi sudah mulai dibangun untuk menanggulangi rob di ibu kota. Nah ini ada beberapa dokumenter mungkin mau melihat sejarah di sana ketika sebelum yang diambil lah bisa langsung nanti diklik linknya karena ini videonya sekitar 20 menit 20 menit. Nah baik selanjutnya itu kalau di pantai kita juga sebenarnya juga terjadi storm surge nah, ataupun hurricane ya tadi sama profis. Nah tapi tidak sering ini saya contohkan 2000 17 Desember itu di Pacitan itu banjir dengan intensitas hujan yang cukup tinggi kala itu juga dengan di lautnya itu juga cukup uh, kondisi gelombang yang cukup ekstrim sehingga di situ hari itu menimbulkan kerusakan kalau kita lihat ini adalah uh, uh, dari ini ya simulasi curah hujan di sana pada hari ke hari itu jadi dampaknya apa dampaknya terhadap dari badai ini terjadi kerusakan di daratan. Ini bisa kita lihat kejadian sebelum dan sesudah. Ya. Yang atas ini sebelum, di Teluk Pacitan. Jadi ada daratan yang terputus. Contohnya ini. Ini sudah di 
tanggul lagi menggunakan batu ini nah, sebelum ini putus jadi laut itu sudah ke dalam nah rumah yang rusak ini terletak di sini jadi ada gelombang yang panjang walaupun tidak sepanjang tsunami itu merusak total bangunan nah ini juga terjadi birusan yang cukup besar bahkan beberapa hutan pantai di sini sudah rusak nanti kita bahas tentang hutan pantainya nah yang paling ekstrim dan powerful itu ada tsunami. Nah, saya di sini hari ini tidak bicara banyak tentang tsunami, tapi ini beberapa contoh yang tsunami yang cukup merusak daratan beberapa tahun terakhir ya. Ini khusus dua dua tsunami terakhir yang terjadi di Indonesia, Kota Palu, ini jembatan kuning yang rusak, kemudian ini akses jalan yang terputus, dan juga ada beberapa seawall di sini memang yang sudah ada itu juga rusak dan termasuk daratannya. Kita ke sana 2018, Bukit Mersi. Kemudian 2018 juga ada tsunami anak Krakatau itu juga merusak, merusak Siwo lah. Kalau yang ini, ini visit kedua kita ke Palu, kita lihat bahwa Siwo, yang Siwo ini memang bukan untuk tsunami, ini Siwo untuk gelombang biasa, itu juga rusak, terlempar sampai 70 meter ke darat, putus. Ini area kerusakannya di sini. Ini putus, area putus. Ini adalah potongan yang putusnya juga. Nah, selain itu juga pada 2018 di ini Donggala, di Donggala itu juga uh, gempa, subsiden, uh, beberapa di pantai ini turun ya, jadi penurunan dan rusak. Baik, itu adalah uh, gambaran uh, uh, daripada uh, nature, rusak karena alam, dan juga akibat campur tangan kita. Nah, di sini untuk yang ketiga itu ada penanganan dengan hutan pantai. Yang sebenarnya kalau coastal green infrastructure ini bukan hanya hutan pantai tapi memanfaatkan yang alami tepatnya. Itu bisa dengan kalau memang seperti pantai selatan itu banyak sendun, pantai selatan Jawa banyak sendun itu bisa dimanfaatkan sebagai natural nature barrier ya. Nah, ini kita contohkan di Pacitan lagi, Pacitan jadi di Pacitan itu setelah senami Pangandaran 2006 itu ditanam vegetasi di sepanjang teluk. Nah ini ada dua pantai di sini ada pantai Telehia dan pantai Pancedor. Ya sebenarnya satu teluk nah, Pacitan. Ya Pacitan itu kan eh, kampungnya mantan presiden kita SB di sana. Eh, jadi di sini itu ada beberapa jenis vegetasi yang dibangun, walaupun pada saat itu tidak semua berhasil tumbuh. Ada beberapa jenis tanaman tidak tumbuh. Nah, jadi ada beberapa yang berhasil dan bisa mengcover wilayah ini. Nah, di sini itu tujuannya sebenarnya yang pertama adalah untuk tsunami. Yang kedua di belakang sini itu masih dimanfaatkan sebagai pertanian, terutama sawah masih dimanfaatkan maupun ladang masih dimanfaatkan. Jadi kita ada melihat sawah. Ya, dengan adanya hutan pantai, otomatis kan eh, air laut intrusinya tidak ke sana di bawah angin, jadi terhambat oleh daun-daun ataupun -daun, pohon-pohon yang di sini. Nah, maka itu salah satu keunggulan untuk apa? Keunggulan daripada eh, green, ya. green pasar dengan biaya tidak besar, tapi lingkungannya tetap terjaga. Nah, kondisinya seperti ini. Ini ada beberapa jenis cemara yang paling banyak adalah cemara laut di sana. Walaupun banyak yang ditanam, ada tujuh ya, ada delapan spesies. Tetapi yang berhasil tumbuh itu hanya beberapa seperti pandanus, kemudian cemara laut kasuarina odoriferae, kemudian ada satu lagi itu yang kita temukan terminal ketapa ataupun pohon ketapang. Ketapang ada di sana. Dan umurnya itu beda-beda. Di sini itu paling lebat. Ini paling besar, di sini diameter pohonnya lebih besar, kemudian di sini lebih juga besar, bagian sini kecil. Dan area ini adalah area yang tidak tumbuh. Dan tidak tumbuh itu tidak diisi lagi waktu itu, sampai sekarang, tidak ditanam lagi. Jadi kita pernah ke sana mencoba mengambil sampel, mengambil sampel untuk melihat pertumbuhannya, dan juga hari itu kita coba melihat gimana sih sebenarnya perform daripada hutan pantai jika itu benar untuk tsunami gitu sebagai mitigasi tsunami. Nah waktu itu kita coba memodelkan, memodelkan 
dengan proteksi alami ini dengan tsunami. Jadi kita modelkan. Sedangkan source-nya itu sumber gempa itu dari pesisir selatan Jawa. Nah, ini berikutlah modelnya ya. Modelnya seperti ini. Kalau kita lihat, ini domain besarnya, area besarnya. Jadi pembangkitan itu dari ini. Kemudian ini bagian pacitan tadi. Yang hitam adalah hutan pantai dengan berbagai umur tadi. Kita detailkan dengan berbagai kerapatan. Kemudian kalau spesies enggak ya, tapi dengan kerapatan aja. Kerapatan dan ini ada yang open space karena tidak tumbuh. Kalau sos sendiri memang uh, hipotetik, sifat hipotetik itu belum terjadi. Uh, tapi kita melihat sejarah bahwa 94 sudah pernah uh, sini sudah pernah dirilis energinya, kemudian 2006 yang pengendaran sudah pernah dirilis energinya. Jadi di sini kalau dalam uh, geologi itu disebut seismic gap ya. Jadi ada belum dilepas, jadi ada potensi itu ada. Ya. Ini kan termasuk lempeng dari uh, Andaman, Nicobar, Sumatera sampai Jawa dan juga NTT ke sana ya. di satu lempengan sama Sunda Megatrust. Jadi di sini kita munculkan pembangkitannya. Nah simulasi ini sendiri memang dengan tempat ini, uh, kita menggunakan beberapa regional untuk mem 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 lebih detail ya. Dan juga dengan waktu komputasi itu, kalau saya tidak salah, ini 90 menit, 90 menit, eh, ataupun satu jam setengah. Jadi waktu itu kita modelkan sampai dengan run up, yaitu sampai dengan gelombangnya itu bisa berinteraksi dengan darat. Nah, nah ini kita lihat dari awal lah, di sini mulai pecah, sedangkan di teluknya itu agak surut dulu. Nah, dia surut dulu, kemudian gelombang pertama itu tiba. Nah, kalau kita lihat justru area terbuka itu lebih cepat dan di sini masih mereduksi, lebih sempat menahan. Nah, di sini lebih cepat lolosnya karena memang itu tadi umur di sini lebih kecil ya, dia terpolusi lebih kecil dan kurang rapat. Nah, tapi uniknya di sini di sungai ada sungai, sungai itu lebih cepat e, merambat melalui sungai tsunaminya ada dua sungai di sini sungai kering dulu, e, satu lagi saya lupa nama sungainya. E, ini lebih besar sungai. Nah, dan juga ada gelombang keduanya kita simulasikan sampai 90 menit waktu itu. Nah, ini tsunami. Nah, kalau kita kembali ke hutan pantai tadi, dia memang benar mampu mereduksi, tetapi ini ada asumsi ya, ada asumsi bahwasanya hutan pantai di sini adalah posisinya itu tidak tercabut, dia itu kondisinya itu tahan terhadap tsunami. Jadi hanya interaksi kekasaran ya interaksi kekasaran, tapi ini tidak hanya kekasaran dasar, tapi kekasaran sudah berbentuk dari porositasnya juga. Jadi bukan hanya dengan mengubah koefisien mini, tapi dengan langsung dengan uh, kekasaran terhadap tumbuhan dari umur tadi, kemudian kerapatan dan juga diameter pohon itu kita masukkan dalam komputasi kita. Nah, dengan asumsi dia tetap bertahan itu mereduksi, jadi memberikan waktu walaupun tidak banyak beberapa menit gitu mereduksi. Nah, tapi yang bahaya kan di area open gap ini. Nah, ini agak bahaya di sini dan di sini gitu. Jadi gelombang lebih sangat cepat uh, masuk ya eh, masuk ke daratan. Nah, Pacitan sendiri itu kalau konturnya sama mirip dengan Banda Aceh, sekitar 2 meter di atas permukaan laut sampai 3 meter, paling banyak itu 3 meter dan agak jauh. Tapi dalam radius 500 meter itu masih 1 sampai 2 meter. Jadi sangat landai. Ya, mirip dengan Banda Aceh. Bedanya kalau Banda Aceh itu lebih banyak sekarang ya, sekarang lebih banyak bala gunanya. Nah, dari sini setelah 2006 ini belum ada tsunami. Jadi belum teruji secara ini belum teruji kondisi hutan pantai. Nah, tetapi 2017 lalu Desember 2017 itu terjadi siklon tropis Cempaka namanya. Nah, kalau di kita itu emang nama si nama badai itu sangat bagus-bagus ya, tapi dampaknya juga cukup luar biasa. Nah, dampaknya apa? Itu menjadi catatan bahwasanya eh, gelombang di saat siklon ini tidak terlalu panjang daripada tsunami, jadi lebih pendek. Dan gaya yang diberikan itu justru lebih kecil ya, seandainya dengan tsunami yang kita modelkan. Tetapi apa? Dampak di daratan itu rupanya sangat di luar perkiraan kita, dia itu bukan hanya hutan pantainya yang tercabut, tapi langsung terjadi gerusan yang cukup besar. Jadi daratannya putus, ini putus, 
ini sudah dikonstruksikan ya. Ini sudah ini putus. Ketika ini putus, gelombang badai itu tadi langsung menuju pemukiman dan merusak. Nah, maka ini menjadi uh, sebuah catatan. Kalau memang tujuannya itu untuk tsunami maupun storm surge, mungkin perlu kombinasi proteksi alami lainnya. Jadi tidak cukup dengan hutan pantai. Tidak cukup. Kecuali mungkin case-case yang sifatnya kecil, ya, seperti tsunami-tsunami uh, kecil yang di bawah. Ada teori, ada teori mengatakan di bawah 4 meter, ada yang mengatakan di bawah 4 meter, lah, lebih kurang. Tapi itu sangat tergantung juga dengan umur daripada hutan pantai itu sendiri dan karakteristik pohonnya. Jadi banyak hal, variabel-variabel yang masih didiskusikan. Nah, jadi memang kalau dalam hal green infrastructure itu, yang paling penting itu adalah bahwasanya kita harus melihat itu karakteristik wilayah yang ingin diproteksi. Ya, misalnya pantainya itu dari apa pasir kah atau dia itu pantainya itu dari berbatu batuan atau berlumpur karena dekat muara. Kita emang harus melihat ini dulu. Kemudian baru kita pilih proteksinya dengan kondisi karakteristik setempat. Dan yang paling penting itu sebenarnya adalah partisipasi lokal. Kenapa ini penting? E, pengalaman kalau kita lihat, ketika itu diimplementasikan misalkan mangrove, mangrove ini kan juga sebenarnya sumber daya, ya. sumber daya. Misalkan bisa digunakan sebagai arah. Jika lokal tidak diseminasi dengan baik, maka itu sudah akan diambil gitu, diambil dan dijadikan sebagai e, mata pencarian untuk menembang dan bahan baku untuk dijadikan arah mangrove dan lainnya. Makanya peran daripada masyarakat lokal itu sangat penting dalam mengimplementasikan ataupun memberikan kesuksesan untuk green infrastructure. Nah, di luar daripada desain ataupun struktur yang diimplementasikan. Nah, selanjutnya itu <tuh> yang paling penting lagi adalah itu adalah jangka panjang. Jadi tidak hanya saat ini, tapi juga dipikirkan ke depan. Misalkan ada zonasi, pantai ini yang dimanfaatkan itu tidak hanya sebagai pemukiman, tapi kemungkinan juga di sebagai untuk rekreasi. Itu juga harus dimanfaatkan. Jadi ketika dia memproteksi, tidak hanya bisa dengan langsung misalkan si wall yang bisa menutup. Nah, kalau memang dimanfaatkan untuk rekreasi seperti di Bali, ya kenapa kita harus membangun si wall? Ya? Justru akan menghilangi keindahannya. Gitu. Nah, maka ada jenis-jenis proteksi yang di rekreasi pantai itu misalkan Senorism, kemudian ada dengan menggunakan uh, growing maupun yang underwater gitu di bawah ya, jadi tidak terlihat. Nah itu seperti di uh, Bali juga juga ada, itu ada US namanya underwater seal. Nah, jadi uh, tidak terlihat, tapi di bawah dia mereduksi gelombang datang itu energi gelombang dengan di bawah ada tetrapod yang ukurannya itu sampai belasan 17 ton itu paling besar di Indonesia ya dan kedua terbesar itu di bawah Wonto Jogja itu ada 11 atau 12 ton gitu di Wonto Jogja. Nah kemudian juga berkesinambungan dalam artian jangan nanti uh, satu pihak di sini akan membangun uh, pelabuhan satu pihak lagi di sini akan ketika pelabuhan dibangun pantai merespon ada wilayah yang teragresi ada wilayah yang terosi Nah, pihak lain lagi itu melakukan penanggulangan terhadap itu tadi. Nah, makanya di sini itu yang paling penting juga adalah adanya uh, diagnosa, kemudian juga apa mencari solusi bersama ya. Nah, transferring the problem to another point gitu. Jadi ada saling berkesinambungan. Itu adalah inti daripada uh, implementasi daripada green structure. Nah, baik untuk yang akhir itu Uh, ini sudah lama, teori ini sudah lama ya, usaha ini, yaitu dengan Integrated Coastal Zone Management, ICZM. Gitu ya. Sifatnya itu sebenarnya ya, mengkombinasikan meng semua aspek pengetahuan, semua aspek uh, sektor dalam hal pengelolaan pantai. Jadi di situ, kalau tidak hanya rekayasa pantai, tapi sosial, kemudian juga lingkungan, itu semua itu dikolaborasikan. Tujuannya itu adalah untuk integrated, ya. jadi berkesambungan sampai ke depan implementasikan. Nah, makanya di sini 
masih banyak uh, sebenarnya PR kita dalam hal untuk pengelolaan sumber daya. Karena sumber daya itu cukup banyak. Cukup banyak, kalau di, apalagi di Indonesia, ya, kepulauan. Tinggal sekarang kita memanfaatkannya seperti apa. Karena kalau memanfaatkan langsung itu, tentu akan saja ada respon-respon lain yang bisa muncul. Karena di sini produk rekayasa secara engineering. Nah, kita bisa memproteksi, kita bisa meminimalisir kerusakan, kita juga bisa menjaga kesinambungannya ke depan. Gitu. Nah, yang terakhir itu ini sebagai uh, tantangan kita ataupun uh, uh, apa namanya kesimpulan ataupun uh, rikasan kita bahwasanya perspektif daripada potensi daripada hutan patah itu masih cukup besar, sudah dimanfaatkan, sudah dikembangkan. Nah, di luar itu kita juga ada ancaman-ancaman. Seperti tadi ya, erosi, sedimentasi, kemudian yang besar-besar tsunami, badai, nah, itu menjadi tantangan bagi kita untuk bisa meminimalisir kerusakan yang bisa terjadi di luar daripada mengambil manfaat daripada pantai itu sendiri. Di luar itu, ini adalah peran besar daripada ilmu teknik pantai. Jadi masih banyak yang bisa kita pelajari, kita teliti, dan kita kembangkan. Dan tentunya ini merupakan tantangan, terutama bagi mahasiswa-mahasiswa ya, untuk bisa langsung melanjutkan dalam hal rekayasa pantai dan mempelajari rekayasa pantai. Ya, itu saja dari saya. Sekian dan terima kasih. Saya kembalikan kepada Prof. Samsidi. Terima kasih banyak Pak Dr. Benazir. Oh ini foto saya di situ ya. Terima kasih banyak. Uh, so let me summarize what Dr. Benazir has presented just now. So he started uh, with the initial background of the coastal engineering uh, studies by explaining a uh, littoral uh, process uh, in terms of longshore sediment transport and effects on of structures on uh, longshore sediment transport. So he gave uh, some several examples uh, from Lampu uh, Beach uh, here in Aceh and the other parts in, in, in Nias Island. Uh, and there are also several examples uh, he took from uh, Sinkil and other parts of uh, in Java. And um, yeah, so uh, in the last part of his presentation, he summarize the importance of integrated coastal zone management. Uh, that means to include also the effects of the watershed dynamics uh, or sediment contributed from river mouth or from the river side. Uh, so that's the overall uh, what uh, Dr. Ben has presented. So he, he avoided to uh, elaborate in mathematical formula in his presentation since most of the uh, participant in these uh, lectures are undergraduate student probably uh, are not fully uh, familiar with the uh, English material. So that's uh, all for the summary of the Dr. Benazi presentation. Uh, demikian Bapak dan Ibu sekalian uh, rangkuman dari presentasi dari Dr. Benazi. Uh, kepada Bapak Ibu yang memiliki pertanyaan, uh, saya persilakan dulu yang ingin bertanya langsung. Saya uh, dapat pertanyaan satu nih di YouTube dari Ibu Tosina. Saya persilakan dulu bagi yang ingin bertanya langsung, silakan. Izin Pak Sam Sidik. Silakan Pak, memperkenalkan Baik. diri dulu langsung, silakan. Baik, makasih. Saya Afiat Anugrahadi dari Fakultas Teknik Kebumian dan Energi Universitas Sri Sakti Jakarta, Pak. Baik, Baik ya. Pak Dr. Benajir. Terima kasih presentasinya yang menarik sekali karena memang bidang ilmu saya berbeda. Saya bidangnya geologi. Tetapi teknik pantai ini rupanya salah satu solusi untuk memecahkan masalah di pantai. Jadi pertanyaan sederhana saya, apakah semua masalah di pantai itu teknik pemecahannya berbeda karena contoh yang disampaikan tadi ada abrasi pantai terus ada longsor karen pantai terus ada tsunami itu apakah teknik 
pemecahan atau solusinya berbeda secara sipil itu yang pertama. Terus yang kedua dari model tsunami tadi bahwa Pak Benazir sudah membuat model dengan sumber tsunaminya adalah gempa bumi. Padahal tsunami itu penyebabnya bukan cuma gempa bumi. Memang yang paling banyak adalah gempa bumi ya. Tapi juga ada longsor bawah laut, ada gunung api bawah laut. malah yang dari luar kemungkinan meteor jatuh bisa menimbulkan tsunami termasuk buatan manusia apa e, nuklir ya uji coba nuklir bisa menimbulkan tsunami nah pertanyaannya apakah model itu yang sudah dibuat itu bisa dianggap apapun sumber tsunaminya yang penting gerakan air ke daratnya saja yang jadi apa e, bahasan atau istilahnya target seberapa jauh kerusakan yang akan terjadi dan sebagainya. Jadi itu dua saja pertanyaannya. Terima kasih Pak Benajir, terima kasih Pak Sidik. Terima kasih Pak Afiat Anugrahadi. Silakan Pak Benazir langsung menjawab. Ya, <tuh> terima kasih Pak Afiat. Ini pertanyaan cukup kompleks bagi saya ini. Ya, yang pertama Pak Afiat memang untuk penanganan ya dalam hal pengelolaan pantai itu. Memang kalau disipil itu ada multidisiplin juga. Dalam artian kita di teknik pantai itu lebih banyak ke gaya, gaya yang disebabkan oleh gelombang salah satunya. Nah, tapi kalau saat implementasi sebuah struktur itu akan banyak juga me, mengapa e, terkait dengan bidang-bidang lain. Misalkan di kita butuh apalagi kalau di pantai itu kan kondisi nya pasir ya sedimennya kemudian ketemu tanah kerasnya masih di bawah jadi masih membutuhkan yang bagian geo geotenik gitu terkait dengan pondasi nah di luar itu juga ada lagi yaitu terkait dengan uh, hidrologinya kalau memang itu ada hubungannya dengan sungai gitu ya sungai kemudian juga ada lagi dengan lingkungan dan juga bahkan sosial karena di awal itu di saat study case itu sendiri justru sosial dulu sebenarnya sosial dan lingkungan bagaimana kebudayaan masyarakat di situ ya misalkan pantai itu dimanfaatkan sebagai mata pencarian kalau di Aceh itu ada yang jala ditarik ke darat tarik pukat nah, justru kalau kita bangun siwal di situ yang masyarakat tidak setuju nah makanya kita akan mencari alternatif di mana kearifan kearifan lokal maupun aktivitas masyarakat itu sendiri itu masih bisa dilaksanakan seperti itu Pak Avian. Jadi dari dari geologi sendiri juga sebenarnya sangat berinteraksi langsung dengan teknik uh, pantai itu benar seperti tadi ya. Nah yang kedua terkait dengan pemodelan kalau yang tadi itu memang uh, kita menggunakan uh, Salwater equation. Ya. Jadi di situ yang digerakkan itu sebenarnya hanya gangguan muka air, gangguan muka air. Kalau memang dia itu gempa, dia dasarnya itu tidak berubah. Tapi yang dimodelkannya itu adalah efek daripada perubahan akibat gempa itu, perubahan muka air itu seperti apa? Di gangguan itu muka air itu seperti apa? Nah, kalau dikombinasikan dengan source ataupun sumber pembangkitan yang lain masih bisa, sangat bisa. Ya, misalkan longsoran, longsoran nanti ada pergerakan di bawah ataupun longsoran yang dari luar. Seperti anak Krakatau bisa kita bilang ada dari luar dan ada dari bawah. Jadi itu masih bisa dilakukan. Nah kalau yang jatuhnya benda laut itu sebenarnya bisa dilakukan, tapi nanti sifatnya itu kita memberikan inisial conditionnya. Jadi gangguan utamanya itu setelah jatuh seperti apa. Jadi tidak memodelkan ketika ada jatuh, karena skala itu besar. Yang bisa memodelkan ya skala jatuh itu. Mungkin bisa, tapi menggunakan super komputer yang canggih sehingga bisa mensimulasikan domain yang besar seperti tadi. Karena uh, sifat itu kan kewilayahan. Tapi kalau skala laboratorium bisa dimodelkan langsung interaksi, ada material yang jatuh ke dalam permukaan masih bisa. Nah, uh, jadi uh, sifatnya uh, kalau tsunami itu adalah gangguan, source itu ada dua pemodelan, yang adalah pemodelan source itu sendiri. baik itu gempa, baik itu longsoran maupun gangguan lain, kemudian baru uh, tsunaminya itu yang merambat sampai dengan kendaraan. Demikian Pak Fian. Baik, uh, 
Dan ada tanggapan lagi Pak Afian? Cukup atau ada Cukup. yang lebih Makasih. Terima kasih Pak Benadir, Pak Disidik. Terima kasih banyak Pak Afian. Uh, kita lanjut ke per we continue to the second question from uh, the YouTube. So this question is addressed to both of the speakers. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Um, so I would like to ask this first to Professor Herman uh, about the influence of uh, the tides, uh, especially uh, for the highest uh, level of the tide. Uh, whether that can give influence uh, to the impacts of coastal hazard. Uh, hold on. Yeah, hold, uh, to coastal hazard. For example, in the case of storm surge, uh, tsunami, or coastal erosion. And is there any mitigation for such kind of uh, impacts, combination between uh, tides, levels, and coastal hazard? Uh, probably, Herman, uh, can you respond first? Uh, yes, of course. It's, it's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, see, see, I'm, can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's an excellent, it's an excellent, uh, it's an excellent question, uh, Professor C.M. Siddiq. Um, yes, of course, the tides play a very important role. Okay, so for a variety of reasons. Um, if the tide is high, the river water will, in some rivers, in some tidal rivers, the water already flows backward when the tide is high, okay? So the water, the river can actually flow in the other direction when the tide is high and then flow back out. Um, so tide has a huge impact in terms of how coastal hazards represent itself because essentially it adds on top, it adds on top of the other hazard. So if the tide is low, then you're kind of lucky because now if your tsunami arrives or if your hurricane arrives and your storm surge arrives and you're starting out with a low tide, that, that uh, you know, gives you more room to play, okay? Gives you more room to play. Um, so um, similar to uplift and subsidence, if you're on the uplifted side, you're better off than if you're on the subsided side. So if, you have, if, the, if, the, if anything hazard arrives at low tide, that's better than if it arrives at high tide, of course. And that depends how big the tide range is, whether it matters or not. So in some places, uh, tide range can be very big. Okay, in the United Kingdom, tide range can be 10 meters. Okay, in, in, uh, in the north of the United States uh, um, and Canada, tide ranges can be 14, 12, 14 meters. So in some places can be very huge. The tide range can be, uh, can be the difference between an empty harbor, dry floor, and, uh, and, and, uh, and a huge water level. So it can make a big difference. But in some places, the tide level is not so big. Okay, so... Um, near the equator, usually the, the tide levels are smaller. The tide level changes are smaller. Um, for example, uh, you know, um, in, in a lot of the island settings, you're looking more at meter kind of tide level changes. So that is not that dramatic, okay? So it does not necessarily make a huge difference if then afterwards you have, you know, 15 meters of tsunami hitting the beach, then that plus minus one meter yeah, it can make a difference, but but it's not going to be as dramatic. So it depends on the scale of things. So for small events in particular, for smaller events, and then also for, for storm surge, it makes a big difference because usually it's uh, it's not on the scale of a mega tsunami. But if you have if you have Indian Ocean style tsunami, then the tide doesn't really matter anymore, at least not uh, the kind of tide levels you have here in Sumatra or in large parts of Indonesia. But um, but if you do have, you know, um, in northern and southern hemispheres where you do have very large tide ranges in certain places, um, then there can be the difference between a disaster and no disaster, right? So, yeah, so it can be, can be huge. Um, but of, of course, there's no control on the tide. So um, the, the only way you can influence the tide is, uh, you know, is, and you don't know when a, a natural disaster happens as a surprise. You don't know when the earth, nobody can predict the earthquake, okay? Nobody can predict the earthquake, so nobody can predict when the tsunami Will be generated <laughs> so until the earthquake actually happens and then we can start forecasting then we can of course know whether the tsunami arrives uh during high tide or during low tide um but for um for local settings uh there's not much that can be done um in terms of uh in terms of trying to use the tide uh to, to do something 
Um, I think there, there is, uh, you, it's basically just going to be additive. It's either going to add or subtract. And then whether the tide is going in or going out can also matter because then the water is going either in or is going out when the hazard arrives, which can exacerbate the uh, overland flow and, 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 and the flooding and the flooding situation. So I think in terms of tides, you're pretty much, uh, you're pretty much at the mercy uh, um, in, terms of, in terms of near field. Um, one of the issues with tides is, and that's one of the things where people can get, can get surprised. That's what we've seen in Java and, 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 and Pangandaran in 2006 tsunami, uh, when the lifeguard is at the tower and he doesn't feel the earthquake. And it's kind of a day with, uh, it's kind of a day, you know, with, with uh, uh, you know, quite a bit of wave activity and so forth. And uh, it can be hard to recognize whether a tide, uh, whether the water is receding if you have a drawdown before the tsunami arrives. Okay. So sometimes, depending on where the tide level is, it can be difficult for the person on the beach to recognize the second potential uh, warning sign. Okay, obviously, depending on where you are relative to subduction zone, you will not get a, a drawdown. But if you do get a drawdown, okay, then that is a last warning, basically. So that's what we've seen in an ocean tsunami. You know, there's in Thailand and so forth. And then also, uh, uh, we've seen huge drawdowns uh, before the wave arrived, right? So that can serve as a warning for people who don't feel the earthquake. Uh, otherwise, the earthquake is the official warning. There's no time to wait. Um, but if the tide level, depending on where the tide level is, you might not recognize that because it might already be expected to be low tide or high tide. And, and the, the, the change, the change of, of the, instant, the beginning of the wave might be kind of masked by that or the eyewitness might get confused by that. So that is one of the challenges there when it comes to, when it comes to using a tsunami drawdown, for example, as, um, as early warning. If the event is not very big, and you're already expecting a low tide at that time of the day, for example, then the, the person on the beach might think, oh, well, this is just normal low tide, but it's actually a little bit lower than normal low tide, right? So, so um, that's some of the challenges, but there's not much you can do there, I think, um, at least not for tsunamis, um, but, also for, but also for hurricanes or cyclones. It's, uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, thank you very much. Uh, I think someone leaked the microphone. Uh, check. Okay, good. All right, uh, thank you, Professor Herman. Yes, uh, actually, uh, yeah, it is a combination between the, the tides and uh, the impact of course hazard is a bit complicated thing. Uh, I would like to ask opinion from Dr. Benazir. Silakan, Pak Benazir. Ya, <tuh> pengaruh pasang surut. Ya, ini memang eh, kalau kita bicara apapun ya, saya bi apa bicara tentang bencana di pesisir ini ya pasti berhubungan. Eh, saya setuju dengan eh, mungkin sudah clear ya disampaikan oleh Prof. Chris tadi. Tapi salah satunya itu eh, coba kita contohkan di pesisir Jakarta tadi banjir rok. Eh, warga di sana itu mengalami banjir rok itu se seminggu dua kali, eh se se sebulan dua kali, sang pasang. Jadi ketika pasang terjadi, itu mereka terpaksa harus bersih-bersih lagi besoknya. Yang sangat mereka khawatirkan itu, ketika musim hujan, debit besar ke sungai, itu saling bertemu dengan pasang tertinggi. Jadi selama, kalau istilah warga di situ, selama banjirnya lewat aman mas, tapi kalau banjirnya nginap itu susah kan. Nah kalau misalkan malam ini banjir besok langsung bisa bersih bersih, ya mereka sudah legowo seperti itu. Tapi kalau sudah berhari-hari itu yang kesulitan. Nah kalau secara teori sebenarnya misalkan untuk tsunami itu pengaruh pasar ya pasti sangat signifikan karena apapun ya kecepatannya itu pasti akan bertambah. Karena di situ akan jadi, si akan jadi. Jadi kedalaman itu berpengaruh. Ketika pasang tertinggi, ya otomatis kedalaman perairan itu jadi juga semakin tinggi. Jadi kecepatan tsunaminya tinggi dan akan sangat mudah dia masuk ke masuk ke daratan. 
dengaran A. Jadi itu mungkin gambarannya. Nah untuk ini nomor dua saya ikut menjawab, terus sendiri. Uh, iya, silakan langsung ya, barangkali bisa bisa Yang dilanjutkan untuk, dengan nomor pertanyaan dua, nomor dua. Untuk nomor dua ini sebenarnya peran uh, untuk preparedness ya. Itu sebenarnya kita harus menghadapi sedaya tiga tahapan. Yang pertama itu adalah kita mempelajari karakteristik daripada kalau kita bicara tsunami ataupun banjir rok, itu adalah karakteristik daripada mereka. Nah itu dengan data-data. Data-data itu ya salah satunya ya dari post survey. Itu bisa dengan seperti yang dilakukan oleh profis yang tadi itu bisa kemana-mana mensurvey setelah kejadian. Nah ataupun satu lagi dengan lebih detil lagi kita simulasikan dari hasil post survey. Sebenarnya peran daripada model itu di situ. Kita bisa merekonstruksi maupun kita bisa merekayasa ke depan gitu sebagai uh, skenario untuk pertimbangan ke depan. Nah, selain itu implementasi langsung itu sebenarnya bisa juga ke masyarakat yaitu dengan mendiseminasi maupun membuat program-program langsung terkait bencana. Kalau kita bicara tsunami sebenarnya sudah banyak dilakukan. Itu baik oleh stakeholder ya, misalkan BPPD setempat maupun dari dari pemerintah daerah setempat maupun dari uh, kampus. Kalau di Aceh itu saya yakin sudah banyak sekali setelah 2004. Misalkan sudah ada seminasi terkait kebencanaan. Kemudian sudah ada juga uh, kurikulum bencana pun saya rasa juga sedang digalak-galakan di sana, sedang diperjuangkan. Maupun ada uh, mata pelajaran khusus gitu dari tahap sampai SD di sekolah terkait kebencanaan. Nah selain itu juga kalau yang langsung sudah dilakukan kan ada tsunami itu ya masyarakat itu mencari lari ketika ada aba-aba ke titik kumpul terdekat mencari rute terbaik nah, itu juga merupakan salah satu persiapan kesiapsiagaan dalam mitigasi tsunami. Nah yang paling penting adalah informasi yang kita sampaikan ke masyarakat itu adalah apa yang harus dilakukan, kapan mereka mengambil keputusan, kemudian apa sesingkat apa respon mereka ketika uh, kalau kita bicara tsunami ketika uh, tsunami itu terjadi kan kalau gempa yang mudah ya gempa ya langsung kita itu sebagai peringatan dini alami gempa ya berarti kita melakukan evakuasi nah, tetapi ada satu hal lagi kejadian 2018 itu ya mungkin karena silent tsunami tidak ada apa-apa seperti gempa ya mungkin kita butuh uh, satu peralatan-peralatan yang memang sifatnya disebut sebagai early warning. Masyarakat lebih mudah tahu. Nah, kalau kita sebagai upaya kita salah satu itu tentunya desiminasi. Dari data tadi kita e, coba kita skenariokan, kemudian desiminasi ke masyarakat yang tentu saja dibantu oleh orang pertama itu dari pihak pemerintah. Mungkin itu saja dari saya, Prof. Sidi, terima kasih. Terima kasih banyak Pak Benazir atas uh, tanggapannya. Uh, now, okay, we have a third question. I think this can be answered both of uh, the speakers about the selections of uh, construct uh, structure for coastal protection. Uh, how do we decide which type of uh, structure that is effective for a certain uh, coastal area, uh, considering the a number of types of coastal structure. Is there any such kind of modeling to see uh, the effectiveness of the structure? Uh, probably I would like to ask Herman first to respond from Suci Alinda. Uh, yeah, so, so the coastal structure of course depends, uh, that's gonna be used, depends a lot on, depends a lot on the setting. Uh, and, and, and the type of shoreline that you have, okay? So the site characterization is very important. Uh, so for example, uh, in the United Kingdom, in Japan, on rocky coastlines, you can build you know, concrete structures directly onto the rock, okay? Um, there, are, there are structures that start offshore, okay? You can have structures um, that, essentially, um, that essentially are breakwaters, they're detached, uh, which are basically in front of the beach, and that is basically to um, reduce the wave impact on the beach. Um, then there are structures uh, which are uh, which are on onshore, 
um, which basically uh, can be rubble mount structures uh, to absorb that wave impact. And then uh, concrete structures uh, to, to avoid uh, reduce overtopping on top, for example, with sea walls and so forth, uh, and then reduce runup, um, protect the areas behind it. Um, typically, um, heavy structures are, are recommended uh, um, for port construction. They're needed, right? Because navigation is one of the key features. Uh, that's typically where you put them or to protect critical facilities uh, like, uh, um, like nuclear power plants and so forth, where, where you need to absolutely make sure that, that nothing happened, okay? Um, now, when it comes to, when it comes to, um, when it comes to low-lying areas, flat areas, sandy areas, silty areas, areas with soft soils, clay, alluvial deposits, and so forth. And unfortunately, a lot of cities are building places like that. Okay, and they're not typically built on the mountain, right? On the, on, the, on the rocky coast. They're actually usually built in, in alluvial areas where there's rivers and so forth. And in, in, and in those kind of estuary settings, um, there are some challenges because when you put a lot of weight onto the soil, then that structure will sink, okay? So just to give you an, an extreme example, if we take Louisiana, we can put a very heavy levee on top. That levee will actually sink uh, quite significantly over time, uh, and that sinkage can be, you know, tens of centimeters. So it, it can actually sink over time by half a meter. Okay, so your structure goes into the ground when it's heavy. Okay, so then you, in those kind of situations, you actually need to you need to make sure you have some some weight distribution. So then, uh, you know, a heavy concrete structure that concentrates the weight in one place uh, might not be the best solution because then you need piles and all this stuff. Uh, it gets quite expensive on the, uh, in the subsurface then. So those are some of, the, some of the challenges there. Now, if you have mangroves to protect, for example, against the waves or, or salt marshes and so forth in front, wetlands, barrier islands uh, that, that take the wave action away, then you can work with, uh, you know, earthen structures and, and, and levees and so forth, which are more like embankments. Uh, that's kind of what I showed you for the city of New Orleans. Uh, the idea then is that there are no, there's no wave action because the moment you have wave action, it's going to be erosion and these things will start to collapse. Okay, but um, for for cities, sometimes those can be uh, uh, can can be useful can be useful structures as long as you already take care of the waves before you get to that structure. If you have to deal with the waves, you need rubble mount structures, you need hard structures. Uh, you, you need to make sure that uh, that the structure remains intact and and, and doesn't uh, uh, doesn't get destroyed by the waves. Now, any structure I've shown you from uh, here from hurricanes, and I've shown you plenty of examples from tsunamis um, on Monday um, and also on Saturday, uh, you know, they can all fail. Okay, so that's one thing you have to understand that no matter what design criteria you have. Okay, just to give you an example from New Orleans, we started out with, you know, after Hurricane Betsy, 200 year hurricane protection plan mandated by the federal government in Washington, D.C., by parliament in the Capitol. Okay. Four years later, Katrina kills almost 2,000 people in New Orleans. New construction, new system, bigger than the old system, but the design criteria has changed. Now it's a 100-year risk reduction plan. Okay, it went from 200 years to 100 years. It's higher than before. It's not even called a protection plan anymore. It's called a risk reduction plan just because with the assumption being that, that well, you know, there's a possibility that things can go wrong. Okay, so I think that's important. The other thing is, in the, in the light of climate change, a lot of these structures are going to get challenged because if you have erosion, and very, very often when you put a structure in, in some places you're going to increase your erosion, okay? You're going to increase your, 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 your erosion on one side or in front, depending on what the structure is, and you might get accretion on the other side. So you're actually very often going to, uh, going to have impact your sediment. So, so, so that's one thing, one thing, to, one thing to know. And the structure is designed for certain water lines. So when the tide changes, uh, then, then how that structure performs can change. And similarly, if the, uh, if the sea level changes, then how that structure is going to perform is going to change over time. That's going to be a huge problem with climate change because generally speaking, a lot of structures are going to start sinking uh, due to the weight of the structure over time. They're going to sink faster than neighboring land. <laughs> and, then, and then the sea level rise is going to go up so that structure, you know, that was optimized for a certain water level um, might not perform the same way anymore. So that's one thing. And then there are the wholesale solutions. 
Okay, so what's one of the things, for example, in the United States, city of Houston, uh, one of the fastest growing cities, not just in the United States, but worldwide, uh, economically growing faster in many cities, in, uh, even in China. Um, so um, it's a huge economic city. Now the, uh, is, uh, they're on track. They're the fourth or fifth largest in the United States now. But in 20 years, Dallas and, and Houston might be bigger than Chicago, for example. Okay, just to give you some idea. Um, uh, there's a huge barrier being built now for uh, which one of the biggest coastal projects in the United States um, that is basically going to um, go along the coastline uh, in Houston. Uh, and it's called, you know, the Ike Dike. So basically to protect against things like Hurricane Ike in Houston. And it's a, it's a gigantic barrier that will essentially cut off uh, a lot to close the entire Houston shipping channel. Okay, which is a very important uh, shipping channel. It's a big port. But the Houston area is also home to some of the largest refineries, not just in the United States, but worldwide. So, so, um, so it plays a huge role in, uh, in, in many ways economically. So it's a huge barrier that goes in um, and essentially closes off the entire shoreline. So that is, uh, that is another approach, okay? Um, in the United States, the first, uh, the first major seawall that had been built was after uh, Galveston Hurricane in 1900, has been there for 100 years. Um, and essentially that's the same location where, where the new barrier is gonna be, but it's basically gonna close off all the bays and so forth. So you're gonna have giant storm surge barriers uh, and they're gonna basically gonna be much bigger than what you have in the Netherlands. And you can essentially close off the entire shoreline uh, for future hurricanes to reduce the, the risk of impact on refineries, on shipping channels and, uh, and so forth. But that is a, a very, very a super expensive, and then it's a wholesale solution. It's no longer trying to, trying to protect just you know uh, locally one beach or so. It's essentially trying to protect an entire, an entire stretch of coastline, tens of kilometers uh, along, um, more on the order of hundred kilometers. So that's just give you some idea of scale. Uh, similar thing has been proposed for other cities like New York City. Okay. Um, there have been pr proposals to, to have a giant barrier between, <laughs> between Long Island and New Jersey, okay? So to basically close, uh, be able to close the entire, uh, the entire Hudson River estuary and so forth um, and channel there. Um, so I don't think that that one is actually going to happen like that. Um, that is gonna be more of a, more of a, a, of a partial solution uh, more localized, but if you have very high value areas, then you then you have to defend. That's what you're doing in Japan with Tokyo City and so forth. Um, but there are there are places where you know in Florida and so forth. When it's beach houses, people enjoying the beach and so forth. Uh, you know, smaller villages. Then perhaps you know if you have to rebuild once every hundred years, or you know, then maybe that's acceptable. You know, so there are. And there are decisions to be made there, right? So with, with some of these structures. Um, and then the biggest one offshore in Japan, um, in terms of not the biggest, but in terms of being deep, I showed you that on, on, on Saturday for Kamaishi, um, that, that's another potential, uh, um, potential solution um, to try to defend against some of these hazards, in particular like tsunamis, um, early on before they hit the shoreline. But again, it didn't really work very well with Kamaishi um, at a very high expense. Um, there were some benefits, but they were quite limited for the cost invested. So uh, it, it depends. So I think for smaller events, all these coastal structures can, can protect, provide quite a bit of coastal protection. For mega events or very large events, I think you know, there are going to be cases where things are not gonna play out so well. And uh, unfortunately, as coastal engineers, as civil engineers, there, there will still be a lot of damage cases to look at in the future. I'm very confident of that. And I'll stop here. Thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> Herman. Uh, now, I would like to give uh, Dr. Benazir also to respond. Yeah, from my side, if the decision is dependent on the construction, that's yang kedua itu kita itu sebenarnya sudah diatur juga oleh uh, permen ya. ada ada survei yang harus kita lihat dulu tingkat kerusakan kemudian nilai daripada wilayah yang rusak itu ada ada di permen ya, 2020 nah dari situ nanti terkait dengan penanganan ya itu tergantung dengan karakteristik wilayah kemudian 
kerusakannya karena apa, jenis kerusakannya apa, kemudian tingkat kerusakannya seperti apa. Nah, selain itu, untuk pemodelan sebenarnya lebih kepada keputusan dalam dalam mengambil keputusan. Jadi, itu adalah skenario yang dibangun. Nanti bisa kalau dengan ini seperti apa ya. Jadi, lebih kepada pengambilan keputusan kalau untuk pemodelan. Sedangkan yang lain itu ya kembali kepada masalahnya itu apa gitu. Jadi pemodelan numerik itu sebagai tool, baik fisik maupun numerik sebagai tool saja sebenarnya dalam kita mendesain atau menentukan kosta struktur seperti apa. Itu saja Prof. Sidik. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Pak Benazir atas responnya. Kita masih ada waktu sekitar 10 menit. Kalau ada satu orang lagi penanya, saya persilakan yang bertanya secara langsung. So, I would like to give one question more from the audience if anyone wants to ask. Silakan Bapak Ibu, adik-adik mahasiswa, kalau masih ada. Uh, ya, yeah. saya tidak melihat ada penanya lagi. So I don't see any more questions from the audience. Uh, yes? No? Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So with that, I think we can conclude uh, our uh, guest lecture for today. Uh, there are a number of lessons that uh, I myself have learned from both of the speakers, from Professor Herman and also from uh, my colleague, Dr. Benazir, from Gajah Mada, and uh, also from based on the questions that uh, come up from uh, the participants. So thank you very much uh, for both of the speakers, to Professor Herman Fritz, and also to Dr. Benazir from Gajah Mada for, for your insightful uh, presentation and sharing your experience to all of us. And thank you to all the audience. To, uh, terima kasih kepada Bapak Ibu peserta, baik yang hadir secara online di Zoom maupun yang hadir uh, secara online di channel YouTube uh, kami. So I record uh, almost 180 participants attend uh, this guest lecturer, uh, 100 of them attending uh, on uh, on Zoom, and the rest uh, attending on YouTube channel. So thank you both. Uh, uh, participants at the both uh, channels. So uh, all, also I would like to thank to the committee on site. <laughs> uh, I believe they have been uh, working uh, so hard to complete three events in sequence for this world class professor uh, program. We have conducted a seminar on uh, Saturday and then followed with, sorry, workshop on Saturday and then followed with a seminar on uh, Monday. And uh, today we complete the third event of the program, which is a, a guest lecturer. Um, and uh, thank you for all the audiences. And uh, tomorrow, Professor Herman Fritz uh, will leave uh, Banda Aceh to uh, US. So thank you so much for having your precious time uh, together with us here in uh, Banda Aceh. So without uh, saying any further, so thank you so much. So I close the session. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Herman. I'll see you tomorrow, Herman. <laughs>